course, you'll learn how I went from working 70 hours a week and staring down the barrel of retiring at 75 to building a service accommodation business and being semi-retired by the age of 37. The likes of Samuel Lee's Progressive Property will charge you thousands to obtain this knowledge. Today, I'm giving it to you for free, and by the end, you'll be able to build a profitable short-term rental business. But before we get into the course, I need to give you some context on how the strategy works. I literally rented a one-bedroom property in Newcastle for £550 a month, which was empty inside and out. Furnished it, and then the next bit was pretty straightforward. I made an account on Airbnb, took some pictures of my iPhone, and then I got this booking. And then this one, and this one, and then this one, and then this one, and then it continued like this. So I quickly realized that there was money in this game. However, there's a lot of mistakes in those first few bookings, which I'm gonna come on to in the course. So stay with me on that one and don't worry too much about the financials. My phone never stopped beeping with all of the bookings. So I quickly came to realize that over the course of a month, I was making considerably more money than the rent that I was paying even with those really cheap bookings. So I started renting and managing more properties and I had around 100 properties within year one. During this course, you will learn the strategy from start to finish. You'll have an area where you can do this and you'll know how to work out a profitable deal and how to market your property to get bookings, how to systemize your business so you can run it from your phone and so much more. In the chapter section, you will see all the different elements I have covered. So if you find this video useful, please subscribe to the channel because I'll be making a lot more content about property investing and also share this with someone else who is looking to invest in property. Now, let's get into the course. Firstly, what is serviced accommodation, short-term rentals, holiday homes, vacation rentals? Well, for starters, these are all the names that it can be called, but they all mean the same thing. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Airbnb, right? However, the misconception for most people who haven't dived under the hood yet is that you rent your own home or a spare room out. This is not how you make a business out of this. Luckily for you, I know how to make a business from it and you're going to discover it all right now. So why would someone pay you to stay in your property for one night or more? FYI, we definitely don't do one night bookings, but I'll come on to that in the pricing and occupancy customization setup section. Tourism, first and foremost, is the second largest industry in the world. So as you will know, travel becomes part of everybody's lives at least maybe once, if not several times a year. For example, I booked a villa in Spain this summer on Airbnb. Now, why didn't I book a hotel? Well, for starters, there's multiple people within the family who necessarily don't want to share a room. I might have shared a room with my dad when I was younger, but I definitely don't want to share a room with him now. I also had my boys and my girlfriend. So we needed a place that would suit everybody, including my dad and his girlfriend as well. And we also wanted a place where we could relax. We're not gonna get bothered. We can swim when we want. We can barbecue when we want. And also the kitchen is a main element. And this is why most people will actually book accommodation over hotels to be able to cook their own food. And it really opens up a different type of holiday experience to what we were once used to when I grew up, where you either had to own an apartment if you wanted to have that, or a villa, or you had to stay in a hotel. There was kind of no in between. So the Airbnb industry has helped fill that void. And if you are operating in holiday destinations, you will set your properties up to deliver this type of experience. Now you can range from small apartments all the way up to massive villas. And the cost of such can range from a few hundred pounds a night, all the way up to hundreds of thousands of pounds a night. The second reason why Airbnbs have become really popular was actually due to COVID. And during COVID, what you had is what they call the digital nomad, avoiding all of the lockdowns and traveling around the world. So a digital nomad is effectively somebody that runs a business from a laptop or a phone and has the flexibility to be able to travel the world. As lockdowns were happening, the digital nomad was looking at a country that wasn't locked down. They were flying there and they would book an accommodation through Airbnb and the likes for 30 days, 60 days, 20 days, depending on what suited themselves. This has become a trend and as businesses are now operating with a lot more flexible holiday policies, I know many companies now will allow you to work several weeks at a time remote. It's meaning that people are able to work away from their destination for long periods of time and therefore they need accommodation. Now, they're not going to go and rent because, for example, in the UK, you have to take a minimum six month rental agreement. In Dubai, you have to take a minimum 12 month rental agreement. So that doesn't really fit the digital nomad. However, what does is short term accommodation where they can just hang their clothes, Wi Fi is included, bills are included, furniture is all set up for them, and they even get their linen and their towels changed on a regular basis. This 
ticks their box and because they're earning good money, they don't mind paying a premium for that service. And this is where our apartments, villas, townhouses, etc., come into play and really help that digital nomad. But at the same time, we get paid quite handsomely for it. Next up, you've got people relocating to new cities. I know here in Dubai, where I am right now, the expat community is constantly growing. Dubai is fueled by expats arriving all the time. Now, until you actually have your Emirates ID here, you can't actually get what's called an Ajari tenancy, and therefore you have no other option but to go into a hotel or rent short term. This is where we will supply everything so they can just come, settle down, and then get into the city and then start getting all their ducks in a row to be able to potentially rent long term. In places in the UK, for example, if I was to move to London, because it's such a big city, I might not know where I want to live in London when I first get there. So what I might do is I might rent somewhere for 30 days at a time until I find a location that I want to rent in. The same goes on in New York, Tokyo, Sydney, and many of the other major cities in the world. They're so big that you don't want to lay down your roots permanently until you really understand and grasp the city and make sure that area of the city works for your life. So again, we fill that need and we become a relocator's best friend at that time. Now there's a few other short-term rental problems that we do solve, but the ones I've covered are typically where your guests are going to come from. The others are insurance companies will need to rehouse people on a regular basis when things like fires break out in properties, big floods, and they have to actually move them out of their home to be able to get the renovations done before moving them back in. Now, because most renovations are under, say, six months or 12 months, then they don't want to rent a place on an AST and then maybe have to buy furniture and things like that. So again, insurance companies reach out to companies like ours and we then supply what we have in terms terms of the budget and what we can fit in terms of the number of beds, number of people, the locations. And if it works for them, they pay us and then they move in their insured party into that property for the agreed amount of time. And then ultimately when their house is refurbished, they move back into their property. So again, another win-win solution for both parties and insurance companies are willing to pay a premium because they know that they're not having to secure properties. They can just pay when they actually use the dates. They don't have to furnish them, etc etc last one that i want to cover and we have done a fair bit of this business is relief accommodation for the governments so in the uk there's many many reasons why people fall out of accommodation now i'm not saying that we're helping the homeless here because that's not what we do but there are things like troubled teenagers uh, we have prisoners that get released we have asylum seekers and there's various people that need housing and they work with the councils. Now, when you get a big enough portfolio, or if you make enough phone calls and build relationships, which I'll come on to in the direct booking strategy later on in the course, you will then open the doors to these type of people and help the government put them in homes again on a short-term basis until they find them longer accommodation. And again, the councils are aware that they need to pay a premium for this and they do so. Now, a bit of word of warning, these bookings are not as glamorous as they sound. In fact, they're far from glamorous. And I would say I've had more hassle from these type of bookings than anything. But if you get the right councils and the right relationships, you can make sure that any damages are covered. But I do think you need to anticipate that these type of uh, bookings do create a bit more damage than usual. So that's just a little word of warning. Now let's come on to the actual business models. So there's three different types of operations that you can have in the business. And I think over time, you're gonna have at least two out of the three, if not three out of the three. And I wanna go through all of the risks, the rewards, and the pros and the cons of each business model. And then you can decide how you wanna deploy by the end of the course. And once we've done all the area analysis and everything that we're gonna be covering, you'll be well equipped to be able to put each strategy into play and build your business. So the first one is purchasing assets for short-term rentals. Now this is by far the most profitable strategy. I actually think it's one of the best property strategies out there amongst them all, including HMOs, buy to lets property development, social housing, and everything else. It gives you a lot of profitability if done right, and you are also going to be building up your net asset value. Now, the risks to this strategy are it can tie up funds and it can be a lot of funds if you're not careful. And the refurb costs can also get out of control if you don't know what you're doing at the beginning. So it's really important that you understand this strategy before you decide to invest any money into it. Several years ago, I bought a few properties and decided to do a bit more to them. Garage extensions, loft conversions, etc. Now, as a quick example, 
One of them I thought was going to be 250k on the end valuation. And I'd estimated the bill cost at around 35 to 40k. What actually happened was the bill cost came in at more like 65k and the valuation came in at 220,000. So as you can see, there's already nearly a 50,000 pound swing there. Now, fortunately for me at that time, I had already been buying assets. I had a lot of rent to rent and management on the go. So my cash flow was very positive. Now, had this been my first deal and I had, say, £75,000 to invest, I would have tied up the majority of my money in that property and I would have then been a bit stuck and it would have slowed my progress down. So these are just some of the things that you really need to be careful of. You need to understand how to cost up refurbs. And remember, I got this wrong and I'd already done a lot of property refurbs, but I still got it wrong because I kind of just went into something new and I didn't quite know how to cost up the extra garage conversion, for example, to the exact penny. And then I also didn't really know how much value that was going to add to the property. I was just guessing based on what had happened previously, when really I was only doing carpets, decorations, new bathrooms and new kitchens, which is very simple. I wasn't really adding any extra space. So I was just running valuations on comparables. Again, I'm going to come on to all this and show you exactly on the computer how we find out what property values are worth. So you don't have to make the same costly mistakes. But they are some of the risks that you can get into with purchasing property and something that you want to be aware of because the last thing you want to do is lock your funds up. Now, on the upside of it, if I wanted to, the property was still worth more than what I had actually invested, including the extra refurbishment cost. So I could have sold the property, probably got out with a bit of profit and restarted the whole process again. But because this is a bit of a slower strategy, you know, it can take, you know, six to nine months to be able to get the keys, refurbish it, get it ready. And and then if I was going to sell it, it probably could have taken another six to nine months before I had the funds back. I decided to keep it. Now, I had the luxury of being able to do that because, again, I had some cash built up from the business already and I had other units that was bringing income in every single month. So I was able to keep hold of that property and I'm glad I did because it now generates around 50 grand a year in revenue. It's a fantastic bit of stock for us and it actually propelled the portfolio forward as I decided to buy more and more stock of this similar size. Again, I'm going to come on to this later later on because I do think the size of the property you're getting into is crucial for cracking this game right now. But as I said, you do have the option to potentially get out of a deal should you get it wrong when you are purchasing. Now, there's many pros with this strategy and it's why it is my favorite strategy. First and foremost, because done correctly, you can spin one pot of money through many, many properties like I have done. I only started with £3,000. I built my pot up and then I bought a property. I refurbished it, I refinanced it. There's plenty of videos on my channel if I don't go in depth enough around the BRR strategy, but it is a superb strategy that you need to get your head around. The next thing is when you own your own assets, you're in full control of those assets. No one can take them away from you. No one can decide that they want their property back and kick you out. You are in full control of everything. You can decide how you want to run it, how many nights you're going to be open. You can do whatever you want with it. It's your property. You own it. You can do whatever you want. And full control in this game is paramount for a successful and long-term business. And I guess the main thing with this strategy is you can build up wealth very, very quickly. Now, I've amassed something that I could have only dreamed of three, four years ago when I first started out to a very lucrative portfolio that I now own. It's mine. That net wealth is mine. If I decided to sell it today, I would have seven figures worth of cash in the bank. And, you know, I guess the main thing for me is it pays me well every single month. So as long as I continue to hold the properties, they'll continue to go up in value. My equity position will continue to increase. And each and every year, I'm getting more and more money out of these properties as we get better and better at running them as short-term rentals. So for me, it's an unbelievable strategy and something that you do definitely want to have. But it's slower. You're not going to go and buy a load of houses tomorrow. Even if you had hundreds of millions of pounds, you would find very difficult to just go and buy loads of stock. You might think that sounds easy. Oh, I've got loads of money. I'll just go and buy the stock. But we always want to make sure we're buying the right stock. So you don't want to just go invest in deep into any old stock. You want to make sure it's the right stock for short-term rentals that that's going to create the least amount of hassle to run and the most profit. Again, I'm going to show you that throughout this video. Now, another thing to note here is because short-term rentals 
rentals isn't as established as say HMOs or buy to lets. The mortgage market isn't as diversified. So you have limited number of lenders and limited number of options, and you will tend to pay high APR. But that doesn't really bother me because we're earning three times on average more revenue than we would if we ran them as a tenancy. So the offset in the extra maybe 1% APR on the mortgage rate is worth paying in my opinion. But once you get going and you understand it and you're working with a mortgage broker on a regular basis, they know what products work for you. You tend to get in with certain lenders and they like your business model and they will continue to lend at you. So I don't think you need to worry about that right now, but it's just a point to note and be aware of. You want to make sure you've always got your exit strategy plan. So Finding a good deal is good, but if you can't get it mortgaged or it's not a mortgageable property, for example, then you're not going to be able to execute the BRR strategy. You're not going to be able to pull your money back out and therefore your money is going to get stuck. So these are just some of the things you've got to be thinking about all the time when you are looking to execute on the BRR strategy. Now, the next strategy is a one that I'm sure most of you probably will deploy straight away. I know it's probably the one that you're all searching YouTube for, and it is rent to rent or rental arbitrage, as it's known in other places apart from the UK. A very, very good strategy. And the great thing about this strategy for me is how quick you can move within weeks you can have a property up and running you can take on four five six properties at once you know something that you can't do when purchasing because of the liquidity that is required now with rent to rent you typically need a six week deposit now i am actually pretty good at getting deals without deposits and again i'll come on to that when we go into the negotiation stage of this course however you're going to need typically a deposit you're going to need some money for furniture and you're going to need just a bit of surplus funds for things like maybe feature walls or, you know, just dolling the place up or a bit of marketing spend, photographs. But all in all, the amount of capital that you need to get that going is minimal compared to buying an asset. And the best thing is you don't need to own a property, obviously. Now, rent to rent in this format is very simple. We are going to rent a property off a landlord and we're going to sublet it on Airbnb, obviously with their permission, of course. Many people wonder how we do this. Many people think that we sneak around the back door and don't tell anyone. That is the worst thing you can do. This model works for everybody and I will explain why landlords want to work with this when I go through the magic 15 points that I've used since day one and they work very well because it is a win-win solution for both parties when you really understand how this model works. But in the main, rent to rent, it can create a lot of quick cash flow. You get the right properties, you can be earning anywhere from 750 to 1500 a month. If you're going into some of the higher end villas, then you can be making well in excess of five, six, seven, ten 10 grand a month. But for the majority of people operating, they're gonna start small because the capital amount is probably low that you've got to invest. And that is how I built my portfolio and how most people build their portfolio because you've got to start somewhere and that allows you to get going. Now, the downside of this strategy is it's very high risk. Obviously, you're gonna be paying a lot higher rent than you would a mortgage. So we have to make sure that these properties are right because by the time you pay the rent, you add the bills on. And if you're not occupied, then you're not going to be bringing in enough revenue to pay the rent to the landlords. And that's when things start to get a bit sticky. But knowing what you know, being good at what you know, knowing your area works, knowing how to put the properties online, knowing how to drive bookings, everything's fine. You're going to make enough money, so don't worry about it. And by the end of this course, you'll know exactly how to do all of that. Now, because the barrier to entry is lower than, say, buying assets, it obviously attracts a lot of competition. And when something is a shiny penny object, which I think rent to rent does often create, right now I do think there's been a lot of people flooding in the market, especially in places like Dubai and also in the UK. Uh, there's many other cities as well where, you know, tourism's come back with a boom. Everyone wants to get involved in it. Everyone sees the YouTube and TikTok videos of people saying, you know, how well they're doing. So naturally, people want to try and get into it. This causes saturation. And I personally feel like the market is saturated at the lower end. And why my model is punching through and why I've remained profitable over the last few years is because I found a niche and we double down on that niche and we only really work in that niche. Now, the, the niche for the UK is different to the niche for Dubai. 
But once you've identified what it is, then you can work that niche to your advantage. And again, I'm gonna show you as we go through the deal analysis section, why I do not want any studios, one beds, two beds, and why I only want the larger stock and why you should really be focusing on this as well. Because for me, the market is saturated at the lower end. So we wanna be swimming against the tide and making sure that we're reducing our risk so that we don't get hit by energy price crisis. We don't get hit by, you know, any more COVIDs or and anything that of a major, um, or not even major, anything just minor turns the, the cards against us on a rent to rent portfolio can see you go from making profit to break even or worse. So we want to try and just mitigate that as much as possible. Now, don't let me scare you off because this is a great strategy and with the right properties, you earn a lot of money and it's very, very safe. But I have seen a lot of people handing keys back. I get the text messages all the time saying, do I want to you know, take rent rent portfolios on that are failing? Uh, so I, I know what goes on in the industry. And if it's not done correctly, and I do think a lot of people are teaching the wrong strategy out there, there's a bit of a recipe for disaster. So that is one of the higher risks of rent to rent over the purchase and side of things. Now, the standards are high in this game in terms of the refurbishments and the cost of getting the place kitted out has gone up since I started the business, but you just swim with the tide. But knowing that the more you invest, you basically want to set something up for the cheapest amount possible, but it cannot look or feel cheap, if that makes sense. You've got to do it on a budget, but you've got to make it look as luxury as possible because with the markets being saturated, because there's a lot of people piling into the game, there's a lot of different people trying different things, but the standard has raised somewhat. And when I first started, you could literally just put a couch and a bed in, stick it on Airbnb and you're making money. It's not like that anymore. You've got to deliver experience and people are after more and more stuff. Since COVID, the, uh, what's the right, I want to say neediness of guests. Um, they, they've become, you know, very particular about they, what, what they want. And if they walk into somewhere and it's not got these type of things, it's not fitted out properly, then you're only opening yourself up for a potential reclaim on the funds um, bad review and as I'll explain later they, these are not good things to have so you want to make sure that you are fitting your properties out right but obviously you want to make sure that you're not spending too much money as well it's really really important because everything we do spend just takes more time to earn it back and therefore your profitability doesn't occur until several months down the line if you overspend versus you know hopefully six seven eight months which is kind of what i aim for so when we're investing in these properties we want to try and get our money back within the first six months and then because we take out three five-year contracts on these things we then have you know four and a half years to be making profit from each and every one now, one last thing on rent to rent in terms of where we're at and the pros and the cons, I think one of the biggest downfalls of rent to rent is the lack of control. So a landlord at any time can turn around and say they want their property back. I know we have contracts in place and you know, they are meant to cover us, but it doesn't happen in all cases. From personal experience, I have had a landlord uh, find out when we weren't booked by obviously going on Airbnb, I assume going with a locksmith, changing the locks, moving into the property, and then just literally sending us an email saying, I'm moving back to my property. Thanks for looking after it for all these years. Um, this did re result in the court case, but obviously we want to try and avoid that. Um, and I now own the property, but uh, cutting the long story short, these things can happen. So we just have to be mindful of it when we are getting into these deals and know that it is a bit higher risk and you have got less control when you are going into a rent to rent deal. Now, the next strategy is management. And I think management is a great strategy to build cash flow. Um, although you do need to be very, very wary of the time and the energy that a management business will take up. I think at the beginning, you see it as uh, no risk because there's no capital outlay. You're not having to spend any money to set properties up. You're literally just gonna take a property from a landlord that's either got a you know distressed property or they maybe want to try an alternative strategy, but they don't wanna do the day-to-day -day hassling. So you will then become a co-host as it's known or obviously a property manager. Now by doing so, you're gonna earn anywhere from 15 to 25% of each and every booking and it can quite quickly become a lucrative strategy for you. But 
What you now have is a guest to answer to and also an, an owner to answer to. And whilst the majority of owners are very pleasant, there is a percentage of owners that will non-stop pick at everything you're doing. They'll be all over the booking calendars. They'll be constantly asking you why you've got gap days. They will be constantly asking you why cleaners haven't cleaned this or cleaners haven't cleaned that. Um, the really needy ones go and check in themselves to the properties uh, without you knowing and then you know go through them. And I get it. Like at the end of the day, they want to make it work, but the amount of time that this can take out of your day from actually then just efficiently running their properties is huge. And I found that I scaled the management company um, very, very, very big. It, it, it was bigger than it is now. I've actually scaled it back down because I felt like we were at a point where we were just basically the money I was earning, I was paying staff because we needed a huge team to run the model that we were running. Now, as we refined the model and brought it back down to Northeast only, and again, I'm gonna come on to control and why you need to only try and operate in one area. Um, I tried to go throughout the whole of the UK and it really hurt my business for quite, quite some time, probably about 12 months. Um, we lost a lot of efficiency, we lost a lot of control, and um, you know things were heading in the wrong direction. And again, I, I am gonna come on to that because I think the idea of uh, learning from somebody that's walked the path you want to walk is, making sure that you don't make the same costly mistakes, right? So I have had to rebuild, but the good thing is when you learn from your mistakes, uh, you rebuild in a much better way. So we've got a much more profitable business now with a much more efficient operation and actually lower operational volume. So we're not having to employ as many staff. We're not having to have as you know many phone calls and many software costs. And, you know, it, it, all, it all reduces the bottom line, basically, in terms of the cost, which increases the profitability. So management can be good, but it can also be bad. And I don't want you to just think oh well i'm not gonna have to pay any money so i can just get into this and therefore i'm gonna make loads of money yes you will uh, make loads of money if you do it right but you do have to make sure that you have everything organized that you're set up and you know that you know what you're doing because the the amount of time that it will consume uh, is huge so you need to be prepared for that and that is definitely one of the risks is that it then distracts you from either purchasing assets or rent to rent because you'll not have the time to be outsourcing the deals or dealing with your own portfolio efficiently or setting up units. So there is knock on effects to having a management company, but I do think if you get it right, um, you can then blend it well because it uses the same software, it uses the same systems, you uh, you know run it the same. And um, if you do it in, the, in, in one location, I think it's much easier to control and it's much easier to scale. If I had my time again, I would never have scaled outside the Northeast. I would have just built up a thousand units in the Northeast and then sold it and I'm going to show you why you would look to sell it and how much that's worth as well um, but that is one of the biggest biggest regrets I think that I've got so far uh, on the management side that being said we you know continue to take on management clients and we're building the management portfolio up and uh, it's not like I'm saying we've just scaled it down and we're not doing it anymore that's not the case it is still a very good business there's just a way to do it and a way not to do it and, and when you take on any old property that's when you start to get into bother let's just say and uh you need to have brand standards you need to make sure you know what you're doing and it helps then make sure that you're not risking other areas of your business for your management business because the management business is also the lowest income okay that's where you're going to earn the least amount of money you think about it you know if if you're charging 15 percent and you make 2000 revenue for your clients you're only getting 300 pounds of that by the time you've paid corp tax setup costs softwares all that sort of stuff you know that can net down to you know probably 120 550 pounds so you've just got to make sure it's worth your while uh, but it is a good business model and it is something that we should consider as we build our service accommodation businesses so in summary of this business model section is i would choose one to start off with uh, whether that's say rent to rent for example and then just focus on that for now don't try and do them all at once. Naturally, once you start to get organized, once you start to understand how the business model works, once you start putting your own systems and processes in place for deal sourcing, onboarding properties, running the properties, then you can start to look at the other two. But for now, I would just focus on one, have a think about what your budget is. You know, If you have no money, let's say for example, you might need to start at the management level. 
if you have a bit of money you might start the rent to rent and obviously if you have a you know a bit more capital then you might look at the purchase side of things now the only caveat to that would be i think if you've got enough funds to buy properties you should definitely look at purchase and rent to rent at the same time because the sourcing element of it is very similar and obviously once we've set the properties up you know it is exactly the same but they're both very lucrative strategies done correctly so but for now let's just you know have an idea write down what you think in terms of the pros and cons go back through it and just see where you're um you probably already know in your mind that one's going to work for me and then as we go through the rest of the course just be thinking about that strategy and then how you can then wrap up all of the other elements that we're going to be talking about into that strategy so by the end you've got a game plan to work towards and then you go out and take massive action and you start building your business so the first thing we're going to do is find an area near you that works now i mentioned it a few times already but you really want to just scale one area there are many reasons for it but mainly for the control factor once you're good in one area um there's plenty of properties right watching this probably just want 10 10 properties there's, there's at least 10 properties available even if you want to scale to thousands most cities will offer thousands of properties you've just got to be able to become very good in what you're doing become very good in your city and you'll become the go-to player it will massively affect your direct booking game as well in a good way obviously um when you become the player in your location you know brand build you get more known for being the specialist in that area and people want to work with you more and more so when we're going in the area research here we're gonna we're gonna look at how to find an area and how to um, build that control model now think about it this way if i and this was one of my biggest problems in the northeast i have my own cleaning team i've got vans on the road i've got my own maintenance team when we get a problem so a guest checks in and let's just say the, the there's, there's a burst pipe okay oh, maybe not extreme let's just say the boiler's not working okay naturally we need a plumber what we would do is we would ring um you know go, go on google would would ring a plumber and would ask them if they're available they'll probably tell us that they're not and they're fully booked for the next three weeks so we then ring another one and this process continues to to repeat itself your agents or you as you're first starting your business out will spend hours just trying to find one plumber for that one job now by the time you found him you then get him over he gives you a quote you do the you know work it, it can take some while all this time the guests getting frustrated whereas we get that into our office as a problem. We ring head of maintenance. Head of maintenance then allocates the right team member. And within probably an hour, that team member's at that property. They fixed it. We don't need to really follow up with the maintenance team and see if they've done the job or not. Whereas with the external plumber, we do. Everything just works so much more efficiently. Your guests are happier, so you get better reviews. And your costs are lower because I don't need a big team to be chasing around maintenance people in random locations like I used to when we operated the whole of the UK. And this is why I had so many operatives because they were spending so much time trying to find external companies to work with. Or we'd get people go to the property or they'd say they were gonna go and let us down. One thing to note, when you're building this business out, now. Again, it depends where you're coming from with this. You might just be wanting to watch this course to maybe get a handful of properties, run them yourself, and make a, you know an extra few thousand pounds a month. And that's cool. If that's, if that's what you want to do, that's absolutely cool. But I think the majority of the people that I do tend to speak to and coach want to build 10, 50, hundreds of properties and earn a lot of money from this. So if you want to do that, you really need to think about this as the business model because spreading yourself too thin only results in a poorer result. It'll give you higher costs and less profit. Whereas if you have everything controlled and build out your own team, then you will make more profit over time. Now, don't worry. Yes, you're going to have to hire people. Yes, you're going to have to put them on salaries and commit to all that. But you'll do it as your business grows. At the beginning, we're just going to build out a team of contractors. And again, later on in the video, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. Um, but for, for, for the back of your mind and building your business out, because I'm a big believer that you should always visualize where you want your business to go and by doing so you can kind of map your way there and that's what we're doing now so kind of build with the end in mind i'm sure you've heard that expression before that's what we're doing here so i just want to get you to start thinking about what is the end game for you and what are you going to need to get there but for me we want to control it because it's 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 easier to scale as we dive into the air dna analysis here which is you know a website that we use to be able to find an area um we're going to look at how we can see if an area is viable and then ultimately you're going to build that area out let's dive into it now and uh we'll take a look around air dna is a 
It's a great tool. Uh, you do have to subscribe to it, but it is it is a great tool that you know gives you a lot of information on you know what we can do. Now, what I'm going to do for the sake of this video is I'm going to just choose a total random area. Now, obviously, Newcastle is where I built the business, and the northeast of England is you know where I know well, as well as Dubai. So I'm going to choose a location that I don't know and then I'm going to walk you through step by step how we analyze the area, how we find out what is the best property size to work with and then you can start making you know, some of your own decisions. For the sake of this um, demonstration, let's choose Manchester, okay, in England. So we'll choose Manchester. You'll see here uh, it's an 81 uh, out of 100 which is, is good. It's a good market area to be in. Uh, we've got annual revenue uh, on average 24K, occupancy rate 54%. Now, a lot of you are probably here 70, 80, 90% occupancy rates and that's where you need to be. You're gonna look at that and go 54, that's a bad area. I'm gonna tell you why that's not such a bad thing. Um, and for me, I don't really focus on occupancy. I wanna know how much it's gonna cost me to run and how much it's gonna make me and then the net profit is obviously mine. You've got average daily rates and your revenue uh, per night. So again, I don't really look at th this metric too much. You'll see here that we've got the total listings available, 5,200. You can see there it's grown 37% in the past year, which comes into my saturation conversation that I was talking about earlier. And this is why we need to swim against the tide. Um, shows you what channels are listed on, but we've got here, we've got 51% of the market is made up of one bedroom apartments another 30% of the market is two bedrooms. So we've got 80% of Manchester's market is one and two bedroom properties. Now, for me, we wanna be playing in this region here. Now, it might you might go, well, that's not where everyone's playing, so why would we wanna do that? Now, it does not mean that there isn't the demand there, it's just everybody's setting up there. Now, and, and I think the reason for it is, and I did it at the beginning as well, you don't wanna, if you don't know how the game works, then you might be a bit, let's say, cautious of going into a higher rent, which a larger house is obviously gonna be a higher rent. Um, you might not wanna spend the money on the furniture because naturally you're gonna need three or four extra beds and get out more rooms. So the cost of getting into the larger stock is more expensive, but for me it is, an absolute game changer and it's where you need to be heading if you want to get into this industry because if not you're going to be swimming with everybody else where it's saturated so how do you how do you compete in a saturated market you've got to have the best listings you've got to be on top of your game five out of five with no hiccups whatsoever in terms of your reviews you've got to be you know delivering a customer experience that is better than anybody else you've got to be able to market your listings like an absolute market genius so you've got all all of the SEO algorithms and everything else in between boxed off. And, and it's a lot, whereas if you just swim against the tide a bit, I, I do personally believe that you make more money and you have less hassle. And again, we're gonna come on to all of this and I'm hoping that this data will show us that there is the, the option to earn the money from the strategy that I like to deploy. So listings by cancellation policies, I'm gonna come on to this as well, but in essence, you have different types of cancellation policies. So you might have a strict cancellation policy whereby you know if they cancel within 30 days, you keep all the money. Obviously, the stricter your policy, the less people are gonna book, um, but obviously the more secure it makes it for you. You've got your, your, your minimum night stays. As you see, it's still 47% are on one night minimums. Um, I'm gonna, again, that was one of the worst things I ever did when I first started out was, was one night bookings, but you don't know what you don't know until you get your experience. And then you can kind of see, you know, what, what, what's happening here in the market. Booking lead time, 48 days. Length of stay on average is three days. An occupancy rate, 54. Now, you've got to remember, this data is from 80% of the market, which is two beds and one bed. Now, if we took the data for the larger properties, would this data change? I pretty much guarantee it would. Okay, so this is how we um, analyze an area. So what you wanna do is just, just open up a spreadsheet um, and just quickly, you want, um, let's just go one bed, um, two bed, three bed. Now, what we wanna look at is the average, um, average daily rate. We wanna look at the occupancy total revenue. So we then go back to Air DNA in our chosen location. And in the listing section, view all, view all, and then we're just gonna work through 
one one so this is for a one bedroom bathrooms and accommodates you can leave as is so just click apply and you want to make sure you choose the active str listings you can see here there's 4.2 thousand uh, for the manchester overview now if you hover over here it's going to show you 14.4 here 55 percent 72 so we then want to put those figures into our spreadsheet 14,400 in terms of the average daily rate what you then can do is you know these are actual live listings so what this then shows is you know one bed one bath um it shows that it's been available 323 days this year its revenue potential is 19.9 because it's it's already generated 18 its occupancy is 39 but you'll see here is daily rates a lot higher than what was you know on the average you've then got you know here this has only been available for um, 93 days so far this year so it's potential if it was open for 365 is this 3.7 so you can kind of just have a quick flick through and what's good about this as well is you can see the difference in the revenues based on the different standards of uh, photos you can actually click through the photos as well which is good so you can see where you need to be you can see here this is a quiet room in a family home that's just somebody renting out uh, their family home whereas you've got a city center rooftop duplex here doing quite well revenue wise but obviously the daily rate's quite low now you can look at the furniture here and say okay well could they do a bit better with that possibly you can see here a romantic woodland lodge revenue is huge compared to the other ones we've looked at but it's a different type of experience that they're obviously selling here can't take everything like for like and you don't just need to take averages but for for what we're doing we're just trying to gather as much data as we can to make an informed decision and then from that we can decide whether this is a good area and also what property listings we're going to go after that's where we're at for the one bed we then repeat this exercise for the two the three the four the five and the six so this has given us our price per night we know roughly as you can see from the graph as well it's, it's increasing all the time and some of the money you might be thinking wow you know i think some of the six bedders there on average are coming in at like 85 grand this is all possible and it does work um, but what we now need to do is work out how much it's going to cost us to buy and also rent that type of property and then from that we can then start deriving some decisions on what we're going to go for and what suits the budget as well because obviously everything does work in terms of profit i just feel like if you want to compete in the saturated market you know around that one two three bed mark then you just need to be uh, very much on top of your game all the time and the competition is very high so for me if we operate in the higher end market uh, then the competition is lower and if we do a good job we're going to still earn very very good money and for me the main thing is there's a good profit margin so if there are any unexpected costs or there is a change as we saw last winter in utility prices in the uk you know there's a margin there to swallow it whereas on the little stock the margins are a lot lower and whilst they're a bit cheaper to get into it can cause more problems later on down the line if the wind decides to blow in a different direction let's just have a further dig in so what do we do next is we go to right move this can be done in any country it can be done with any uh, data air dna works all over the world i'm going to use right move which is uk specific but if you want to say analyze dubai you can use bayou's property finder debizzle and if you're in america you can use zillow the methodology is exactly the same what we're now going to do is go manchester what we want to do is um just have a look at a uh, number of bedrooms so um, we'll go one bed uh, one bed and we'll go find properties again on here what we want to do is just put um, sale price and all we're going to do is work out the average. When you're analyzing an area, you want to try and just look at the core and then obviously you, you will push out. I know when I first started, I only wanted apartments in the city centre, but then I quickly realised that the fringes work quite well. So I'm actually going to go Manchester plus five miles because especially the larger stock, it works better in out of, out of city areas, whereas the uh the, uh the the one beds the two beds they're going to work better in the city center if you're going after the tourism markets what i want to do is just uh have a look at uh the one bed market here uh and on a five mile radius so i'm going to state my ground here at 150k i think um that that's probably a good starting point for uh, for the properties let's go two beds we'll just run this data all the way through 
So you can start to see that once we've pushed the data out, we are getting a lower, obviously, price to purchase. And that will make a massive difference to the properties that we're going to choose to buy in order to make them work for short term rentals. Obviously, if we can find a property that's, say, half the price of a city centre, but then it's going to bring in the same amount of money, then naturally we're going to make more profit. So the next thing we're going to do is just quickly work out what the mortgage cost is going to be at a, you know, let's say you're going to be 75% loan to value. Um, I've said this a million times, but uh, on all my podcasts and things like that, the best thing I've ever done is learn how to do spreadsheet formula. Um, you can do many quick courses on places like Udemy.com and things like that. Um, but it really helped me build a business and, and also I have become very quick and slick. So I'm just going to quickly add the formula in here. So what we're basically doing is we want to work out what 75% uh, because that's the amount that we're going to borrow uh, on a mortgage is um, at a certain interest rate and now we're just going to choose 6% for now that's roughly you know where interest rates are at the minute in terms of mortgages at the time of the recording so that's going to give us a mortgage of 6750 uh, a year in terms of cost and then we just copy that all the way along and that will then do if you want to break it down into uh, monthly then obviously you can do that very quickly as well so you know roughly what that's going to be so that's kind of how much it's going to cost then we want to do the same exercise but we want to actually be looking at the rental amount so you want to go down the rent to rent strategy then you're going to run a very similar exercise so we're going to go to manchester we're going to look at probably plus five miles and we're going to look at what the rental is or the average rentals are for one bed all the way up to sort of six bed properties so we'll do that now and then we'll come back and analyze the data and then this is going to all just help us make decisions on where we want to go where we're going to focus our energy and by doing the research and putting the time in here it gives you a good game plan which i talked about at the beginning to be able to then go and execute and this is definitely how i got results you know i was viewing 25 properties a week but probably seven or eight of them were just wrong areas wrong properties i should never have gone on the viewings there's a part of me that says that every one of those viewings taught me more about what not to do as opposed to um you know what to do and, and not going on them i might not have then be able to refine my strategy as much but i guess i've done the hard work so you don't have to so i'm going to kind of show what i'm trying to show here is how to identify what you need to go after and then we go search for that once we've got our uh, sale or rent now what we want to do is, is then work out our profit margins so, um, sale profit uh, and rental profit so we want to then um, effectively we've got our total revenue and then we've got our mortgage so we're going to basically equals the total revenue minus the, uh, the the 12 month mortgage cost and that's going to give us this isn't our net net profit because obviously we've got operational costs and everything else to consider as well, which, you know, we'll come on to. We're just at this stage doing some area analysis and then we'll go deeper into the area analysis thereafter. Um, and then the rent up is exactly the same. So it's the revenue um, minus obviously uh, what the rent's going to be. Now, I've obviously put the rent in here as a monthly figure, so I need to times that by 12. So again, I'll just uh, use my formula knowledge to do that. And that then gives us um, the rental profit. Now, naturally, as you can see, the rental profit is less than the mortgage profit because we're going to be paying the mortgage rather than the rent. So, um, but, you know, all in all, there's uh, some, some good profit in here for the properties. But as you can see here, you're coming into a lot larger profit for the bigger units than you are the lower units. You know, a one bed making 4,800 a year for me, it doesn't take much to get 4,800 worth of profit wiped out. And as we mentioned earlier, we've not even added in the other costs in here, the utilities, the linen, the cleaning, and so on and so forth. So when we do that and we dive deeper, then we're going to unearth that, you know, probably the smaller stock is again, as I said earlier in the video, very high risk. Uh, low profit margins and at the same time you're going to be dealing with the same number of guests now think about it this way would you rather have say five properties that earned three thousand pounds net profit per month that had maybe two or three guests per month or would you rather have 20 properties that earned maybe 500 pounds a month and you had again two three maybe four guests per month in each property 
you're going to be earning something similar from those two batches of properties but on this one where you've got a lot more guests to deal with you're going to need a larger team because you're going to have more messaging more phone calls uh, more guest problems to sort check-ins more checkouts what we're trying to do here is um, i'm trying to teach you that this model is very very effective in more ways than just the money and that is ultimately the business model that we want to try and execute because i think long term at the beginning all you care about really is the money that's why most people get into this you want to create a side income you want to create some passive income possibly you want to just add that extra revenue into your life i know that was definitely the case for me i wanted out my job and, and so on and so forth but as you build your business and you get more and more money it becomes less about the money and it becomes more about your time and that's where i think if you can just build the efficient model from day one then it's going to be much better for you you're going to make more profit and you're going to have a much nicer journey because listen dealing with guests is it's stressful these businesses they're not passive income businesses there's no way in the world they are even if you give it off to a management company uh, they're still not passive you're still going to have to be on top of that management company uh, to make sure that they're getting the best for your property and your return okay so we've identified what we're going to go after now i want to deep dive a bit more into the deal analysis which i'm sure is the part that most of you really want to see I dive into the computer and I'm going to show you on my screen how I analyze firstly a BRRR deal and then we'll look at a rent to rent deal as well using my deal analyzer. So let's dive in and have a look and we shall see what we're looking for, how we do it, how we find the properties and more importantly how we analyze the figures to make sure that we are staying profitable from day one. Because as we've mentioned a few times in the video, you can easily get caught on the wrong side of, of both rent to rent and purchases and assets. So it's really important that you know how to do it properly. First and foremost, let's dive into right move and we're just gonna put three bedroom minimum. Uh, we will put say a maximum price of say 250,000. We're staying on the Manchester area, obviously for the sake of the video and we're just going to search for some properties as i said earlier we want to look for something that uh, reminds me of my granny's house that's how i kind of in my head when i was a young boy you got like green carpets uh, wooden bathrooms that type of look uh, for me i know is old and therefore these properties would need modernizing this first property here that's popped up is possibly a great uh, option for us to dive into <laughs> definitely uh, you can see there the wooden bathrooms the wooden kitchens green this is um this is a good example. I'm going to dive into this one here. Uh, you can also see here it was first listed on the 2nd of the 9th. So this is the property log extension that I would advise everybody to get. It's free. It's just a Chrome extension uh, inserted. It tells you all about the property. So we've got this one here for 190. Let's just open this up in a different browser and we'll start to look at it. 2nd so Avenue Swinton M27 is where we start. I'd come onto my deal analyzer and I'd just put in here 2nd Avenue. And then we're going to have, uh, it's a property type, it's a three bedroom terrace, so three vintage kit terrace. And I'd also want to put the date in, I mean I typically try and put the date that I'd view the property but it doesn't matter. The idea of this is it actually then becomes a follow up process as well, this is actually a pipeline. So as you see, each column here we're going to have uh, new data in for different properties. And what you'll find is having a conversation with my brother who does a lot of sourcing for me back in the Northeast. Um, and, you know, we've actually gone back every few weeks. We go right back to the beginning of the spreadsheet and we just work back through all the links and we see if they're still advertised. If they are still advertised, we have a look to see if there's been any price drops. And obviously we'll go back to the agent and just see what's happening with the property. And as we did yesterday, you know, we went back to one that we saw several months ago. It's still listed. We've noticed there's a price drop. So we've gone and spoken to the agent yesterday and we've increased our offer by three grand and i'm hoping today that we might secure that because they're going to become more motivated the more that their property is not selling to actually then di discount it a bit further and possibly even come back to an investor that's already been on can move quickly has cash funds all that sort of stuff there's no change we become um quite attractive to, to people when when they start to get desperate and need out so let let's just uh take a look at this one so we've got second second avenue swinton m27 uh what i also want to do is i pop the link of the property uh into the deal analyzer under the website section here and again that's so when we are doing our follow-up we just come back we click the link and if the property's still listed it'll come straight back up now purchase price here they're wanting 190 now that's not going to be my purchase price uh, per se what I want to do first is have a look at um, the comparable. So we've got three bedroom, freehold, uh, chain free, 
uh, we want to have a look at the property sale history and then I will go to nearby sold prices. I work backwards because I think the money is made in um, the buying of the property. May, if you buy correct, you will always stay on the right side of the figures. Yeah, of course, we're going to make money operating it. But for me, I like to refinance out myself. So I want to know what I'm going to get as a refinance. And then I work the figures back, which I'm going to show you. And hopefully it'll, it'll help make sense for you all. Here we've got three bed terrace at 195 sold in 2021. I've got four bed semi in 2018, uh, terrace 2016, that date is probably a bit too old. So what I then wanna do is I'll go terrace and I'll open up the area a bit to quarter mile. Uh, obviously we're comparing a three bedroom terrace. So we've got three bed terrace 275, three bed terrace 263, 296. These are all in 2023, uh, 290, 265, 287. For me here, I'm going to say that a conservative figure, uh, because I know how valuers like to downvalue these days. Uh, everyone's very cautious at the minute. So I'm going to put in here that there's a new market value of 250,000. So once we've done our refurbishment, we've done it up, there's going to be a valuation of 250,000. Now you'll see already that things are starting to automatically pop populate in this spreadsheet. That is because a lot of formula in here, the gray areas are the only bits that I need to fill in and then the rest takes care of itself. So again, I'm saving a lot of time and hustle. Now, we wanna obviously view this property in an ideal world, um, but for the sake of this, we're, we're not gonna view it, but let's just have a quick look at what we think needs doing to it. Gonna need carpet, decoration, um, we're gonna need uh, walls. Uh, they do look like they will need um, stripping. We've got a new kitchen going in there. We've got a new bathroom, um, decoration, garden. Probably needs a bit of a tidy up. Uh, it looks a bit old, so I'm gonna say it might need a bit of wiring. Um, just have a look at the floor plan here just to see how many bathrooms it does have or whether we can actually add any, any space to it. So we've got um, fairly small downstairs and we've got, yeah, just the one bathroom. I'm going to, off the top of my head, uh, just for the sake of this example, I'm gonna estimate the refurb cost on this at 25,000. So legal fees, probably looking at 1500. Um, there's no sourcing fee, broker fee, depending on what you might pay, uh, 495. Now, the monthly rent, obviously we'll come on to that in a second. Um, so we're gonna use obviously AirDNA because I'm gonna short term rent this property. Uh, it is a freehold property here, so we shouldn't have too many issues with the title. So again, if you're wanting to run Airbnbs, then leasehold properties for me are just a no-go. It's not worth the time, it's not worth the hassle. Um, they might allow it, but then they could bring in a management company to run the block, for example, and then they might not allow it. So for me, I just go after freehold houses and then it saves any um, hassle on that front. Let's dive into uh, the, the, the rental value of it. So just quickly get logged into Air DNA. So Second Avenue, Swinton, Manchester. That's where this property is. It's a three bedroom property. We're not gonna be able to extend it. Um, I would like to buy sort of ones with an extra lounge or two, two sort of lounge areas downstairs and you're making them into a four bed. I think that's where you can really add some value, especially for what we do. Uh, but for this example, we, we don't have that luxury. So we're just gonna go three bed, one bath and six guests. And this is coming out, it's 34, uh, 35 grand a year. And let's just see what sort of comparables are on the market. So we've got um, 42K, 21, we've got nine, um, which is probably pulling the data down slightly. These two are seem a bit better kitted out. We'll just, we'll, we'll go with this for the, for the sake of it. So let's say 34K um, all in all. So what we do is come back to our deal analyzer um, equals 34,000 divided by 12. So the deal analyzer does um, you know, work on a monthly basis. Uh, there's no letting agent fees because I'm going to be managing it myself. If obviously you wanted to pass this on to a short-term rental management company, you would probably pay somewhere between 15 and 25% of the revenue received. Um, insurance probably going to be something like 21 a month. Now, the net profit here, um, you'll see on the next stage that we look at, um, I've got um, on, on this spreadsheet here, We've got a much more detailed essay analysis that we would go into. 
Um, you can, if you want, um, go through this and then pull the figure back to the BRR. I will run through that on the rent to rent side of um, things shortly. So I'm not gonna do that now just to kind of save a bit of time. So if we just dive back here, what I'm going to do, cause that's pulling in a net profit here. So I'm just actually gonna, in the lettings agents fee box here, I'm just gonna put in here, um, let's say 550 for operational costs, which is kind of utilities cleaning and um, that sort of stuff. Uh, we've got in here, we've got 25% deposit and again, mortgage arrangement fee. Was, this hasn't calculated yet because we haven't put the purchase price in. So let's just say we put in here, uh, we'll start with the 190,000 that the vendor's looking for and it's starting to pull through. Now I would take a bridge and loan out. Now bridge and loans typically need 30% deposit. So I'm gonna change that to 30%. Obviously when we go to remortgage, it's 25%. Uh, mortgage arrangement fee um, depends on the bridge and lender, but you're looking at anywhere from one to, to 2%. So I'll put one and a half in there. And the interest rate monthly, you're probably looking at about, um, you're gonna be looking at about 1% on a bridge and loan. So you put that in there at 12%, um, and that's obviously 1% per month. Uh, you might get slightly cheaper if you've if you you know got a good lender, you've got a good relationship, you might get a better deal. But in the main, that should, that should cover that. Uh, we've got the monthly rent in here. We've got the new market value. You'll see here we're going to refinance at 75%. Uh, the mortgage arrangement fee, uh, we'll probably put in there at 1%. Uh, no exit penalties, new monthly mortgage interest rate, uh, 4%. Used to be a thing of the past, but not so much now. So let's go 6%. And we've got a sale price. So flip viability calculator, if you wanted to, to flip it, that gives you an idea there of, of where that's coming out. Now you'll see here the total investment cost is 93 grand. Uh, we've also got the monthly net cash flow of 912. So this is saying there'll be 102 months before all the money's out of the deal. Gives us our gross yield, net yield, return on investment. We've got the invest total investment costs, uh, refinance monthly cash flow, cash out from the refinancing, which is the important bit. So this is going to give us 54,400 back out of the deal. Uh, stress test monthly payment again uh, 1246 so the stress test is basically even if you're going to go short-term rental a lot of lenders will still value it as a assured short-term tenancy and therefore they'll use the market rent as the stress test the stress test is typically around 5.5 percent apr times 125 percent and if it meets that figure then they will borrow you the full 75%. If not, they may reduce it down or not borrow at all. So it is important to understand stress testing uh, to make sure that you can remortgage out of the product. Last thing you wanna do is buy a property that you can't refinance and all your money gets stuck in or you gotta wait for a flip to sell it on, which could result in a desperate sale and a loss, but it'll mainly result in a lot of time wasted because from purchase to selling of the asset, especially in places like the UK, it can take a long time, you know, conveyances three to four months. Um, in Dubai, it's a lot quicker, you know, 20 odd days, but um, for the purpose of this, we're, we're gonna talk about the UK market. Uh, money left in the deal, 38,000. Um, no months before the money's left in, it's 29 months. So, you know, just over two years, which isn't too bad. You know, I know a lot of buy let investors will uh, work on about 60 months to get money out. So that's why I have probably grown a lot quicker than most because I've focused on short-term rental, gives you extra cash flow, and ultimately you can move a lot quicker. Obviously, we're going to create 22 grand's worth of equity from day one in the property after all costs considered. So this has given us a good guide as to as to what the deal looks like. Now, I depend on your parameters. Now, you might say I only want to leave 20 grand in a deal, or I only want to leave 30 grand in a deal. Um, Several years ago when I started, you could get all money out and there are still deals where you can do that. But in the main, I, I never used to leave more than seven grand in a deal. That was my limit. But the times have changed and I think as you go more into the bigger stock, you need to leave a bit more money in. But the good thing is that the payback is still um, fairly quick because you're going to, you know, as it's saying there, you're going to average at least 12 grand. Um, this isn't actually for me that good of a deal, but for the sake of analyzing it, um, you know, I'm showing you how it works. So we might say, okay, well, we're prepared to offer 175,000 because then that only leaves me 22 grand in the deal and within 17 months, that money's gonna come back out. So I just playing around with the figures here. Um, you can see how much you wanna offer and then if they come back and renegotiate, you can just put in the renegotiation figure and it will change it all through. A few other sort of tips on, on this is you can use, um, you wanna find out what the EPC register is. Um, you know, obviously, 
again for mortgage purposes they've got to be to a certain standard and um, you know the government are or have been trying to bring it into play in the uk uh, but I know they've squashed that now because they realized that it wasn't going to be uh, possible. But you want to try and get an EPC rating that's as high as possible because uh, obviously when we're running short-term rentals, people do leave heating on. They, do, they don't treat it as their own. So for your own bills, uh, something with a low EPC, EPC rating is obviously going to cost you more money to run. Um, so anything that you can do to improve it is also going to help in the refurbishment. Uh, you can then use any of these websites here and put in the comparable. So I showed you briefly how I use uh, Rightmove to do that. So you would then say, okay, well, you know, we've got Rightmove comparables are coming out at, you know, an average of, let's say, um, 200, where we are, at right now, let's just say we, we said 250,000 there. Let's just say for argument's sake, Zoopla was coming out at 275,000. Um, then you've got um, net house prices and mouse price valuation instant compare um, the the idea of this is to just get as many comparables as possible now if you really want the hack if you use a my spreadsheet you'll see here the formula divides it by these four columns um, if you decided that you uh, weren't going to use these these columns then you can just change the formula to, to pick the columns that you do want so let's just say for example um, I just wanted to pick that column plus that column and then obviously uh, close brackets, divide by two. So that's given us an average of 262,500. So you might then say, okay, well, the sale, um, the ongoing sale price is 262,500 because you think that's what you're going to get as a revaluation. And then as you can see, it just changes the figures all the way back through. This now starts to look like a really good deal because it's only 11 months before you leave, uh, get your money all out. You've left 13 grand in the deal. You're going to refinance out 74K. So that comes back into your pot and then you can go again. That's how I kind of analyze deals uh, on a on a purchase side. And I would just continue to, to go through right move and just try and find, see what properties we do have. Now, the thing with this is you can, um, you can do two ways. I think too many people get a bit analysis paralysis and they try and get the exact deal before they'll go on a viewing. I often say that don't go on a viewing to view the property. You go on a viewing to build a relationship. And this is the same for any rent to rents or whether you're buying through agents or you're trying to buy direct with a vendor. You will meet people of all shapes, sizes and personalities. And it's, it's really beneficial to your property journey the bigger you build your network so trying to find the perfect deal and only going in one view and for me i would just literally go through these i would identify all of the properties that i want to have a look at so again i'm just flicking through pictures to see if i can see uh, my granny's house so let's just you know we've got one which is the very first one uh, this one here you go you can sort of see the carpets um this is you know, a bit old school. Uh, yeah, that needs bathrooms, decorations, probably a bit value to add to that. As you can see here, multiple price drops been on the market since May. So it probably suggests to me that it's overpriced, uh, but that also smells an opportunity. So I would just put that link in my spreadsheet as well. I would just keep doing this. You can see here, all of these price changes, although not very much from the start price, up and down, up and down, means they probably haven't got that much room to maneuver, uh, but they're desperate to sell. Uh, again, this one looks like a good opportunity. You can see here instantly there, that for me smells a, a second room. And we'll just dive into this so I can show you because this is the type of stock that you really wanna be trying to go after. Um, if it's got a floor plan, uh, superb, here we go. So you'll see here, dining room, reception room, that is perfect for what we're looking for to add extra room for the short-term rental side of stuff. So it's currently a three bedroom, but that'll be two large bedrooms plus a little room. You could potentially try and sneak some some room here to create that but it might not be worth it instead what we would do is we would turn this into a bedroom and then we'd have four bedrooms put an ensuite in the corner have the dining living room kitchen all as one as an open plan and you've added value to that property but more at the point you've had an extra bedroom which is worth at least i would say five to seven thousand per year on short-term rentals per property so again you know you're just adding in that extra bit of bit of money plus you're going to hopefully ensure that you get a bit more refinance uh, out of the deal that's kind of what i do and i'm looking through um on the the purchasing side of things obviously there's other websites zoopla and um you know obviously if you're in dubai you've got you know property finder divisible bay all those sort of things um and, and if you're looking to add value that's what we're doing but um that that's how i look for properties then we get on the viewings and then from that we come back and do a bit more of an in-depth analysis 
Uh, with the refurb costs, you would just right click and then we go uh, insert note. And this is where you would like, you know, detail four and a half grand kitchen. And then you might put, you know, um, three grand, you know, wiring, et cetera, et cetera. So then you've got notes because remember, um, you know, and there's also a note section down here, which is really important because you're not going to remember every view and that you go on especially if you do 10 in one day you need to have a strategy to be able to get this done this you can put on your phone or what i used to do is i used to take photographs of each one but then when i got back in the car i used to put the address the you know this is the first viewing um, i used to have a memorable thing had red carpet in the living room so i can then refer back the photographs because honestly if you do 10 viewings in a day a lot of stuff's going to get mixed up you're going to forget about what you saw when and you've got to get religious with you know making notes and uh, then transferring the notes to here because as i said earlier we have um, gone back to a, a property that we saw months ago that probably seen a hundred properties since that point there's no way in the world you're going to remember what that property was about what the refurb was if there's anything major so you've got to put it in your notes and this is what this sheet is for this is not just a deal analyzer for me this is also a follow-up tool and a memory jogging tool to be able to make the best decision so we're not having to then re-go out and view the property we've already done it we just look into our notes we know if we can creep uh, our offer up or if we're stuck at a certain amount or if we can shave off any refurb anywhere and then we can you know hopefully get more deals because a lot of your deals will actually come from your pipeline a lot of people expect to go out on a viewing do the viewing get a deal that week that's not really how it works yeah there's the odd one that you know you go you'll make an offer and you go into negotiation and 24 hours later you've probably agreed something but in the main a lot of people especially the stuff coming fresh on the market they want to try and hold out for the best offer so you might offer below what they're asking for and then they will say okay well we'll consider it but we're going to hang on because we've got the five viewings booked in or whatever but as time goes on that's when they get more motivated and that's best deals for us that's that they're the deals that we're wanting to pick up so that's kind of uh, what we do on the purchasing side. So now we'll look at the rent to rent side and I'll show you how the calculator works on that front. So again, um, we'll just choose um, Manchester, for example, and uh, we will go to, um, well, let's just go to open rent. So open rent is a great site for finding direct to landlord deals. Um, open rent, so as a landlord, unless you've got an agency uh, or an agency license with Rightmove, which is obviously quite expensive, uh, you can't list on Rightmove, Zoopla and, and, and portals like that. So if you want to cut the agents out and not use them, you would go to a site like open rent and uh, you would then advertise your property on open rent and then your taking control of that but then what open rent does is it pushes it to right move and zoopla so any inquiries that you uh, get come direct to yourself to your phone and um and then obviously your deal and for us as, as prospecting uh, anybody on here right now these are all landlords so if i you know click view details and i then get the landlord's details here so message landlord or request viewing that will actually hit the landlord's inbox now there are some agencies who do get onto these sites or you might have uh, let's see here like mc short stays so you know this is short stay company a little hack here um we actually use open rent to get direct bookings um so you may see a lot of short stay companies on here as well so you just got to weed them out because naturally uh, they're not going to rent you their property because they're already doing rent to rent or, or obviously running as a short term. This here just looks like a normal landlord. Um, you know, we can message the landlord here. They're wanting 1,325 for a one bed flat in Transmission House M4. Let's use this as an example. Uh, we come over to the rent to rent analysis side of things here. And we, again, you're just going to put in the links. So just, you know, copy in here. Oh, new website box has disappeared, so I'll just pop it in there. Um, and we've got the date again, so 27th, 23. Lead source, if, if you want to keep up with that. The more you fill in here, the better. Okay, so obviously I'm just going to skip a few things uh, just to keep things moving. Uh, so we've got Transmission House M4, so I'm just going to jump to Air DNA. And we're going to go explore short term rentals. Street in Manchester, there we go. Now, obviously, there are other ways to analyze deals. I just 
take our DNA as a quick snapshot. Uh, I think uh, the more experience you get, the less time you spend analyzing deals because you kind of have a good feeling and you can you can use data. But it is really important that you check around. Uh, the other options you've got as well is to you know dive into Airbnb and just have a look what's being advertised, what the nightly rates are for various units in a similar location of a similar size. Have a look at the quality of them, how they're furnishing them, how they're kitting them out. And again, just come to some sort of assumptions of averages. You can even have a look at their calendars, have a look for the next two weeks, see how booked they are. Uh, the reason I say the next two weeks is because the average lead time at the minute is about 11 days booking so anything outside of 11 days um you're not going to see loads of calendars really that full up because you know most people are booking around that 11 day before the stay i wouldn't panic if after that two weeks if there's 30 days of gap or, or even longer because the booking trend at the minute is 11 days or so before depending on the property type and location um but one bed uh one bathroom and i'll stick with four guests because we'll probably put a sofa bed in or maybe three guests sometimes the sofa bed's a bit tight for two people so we've got 30k 57 percent occupancy 147 so let's just assume we're going to take these figures for gospel um we are going to need to furnish the property so uh, a one bed flat probably costs somewhere in between four thousand obviously you could do it yourself rather than using uh, a specialist company it would be a bit cheaper go to ikea uh, go to um you know your home centers yeah, various places you know you can even go on facebook marketplace and pick up some second hand stuff just be mindful that the quality needs to be there we want to be kitting these places out with a luxury feel on a budget that's the main thing um now, depending on how good you are at negotiating, you may or may not have to pay a deposit. For the sake of this, I'm going to put um, 13 to 50 as the deposit because that was the rent. Uh, refurbishment, uh, probably not much to do. It looked like the flat was in okay condition. Let's just have a little look. I'm saying that we didn't actually even look at the pictures. I just saw the outside and it looked all right. Um, so, yeah, uh, this looks fairly, fairly nice. Uh, probably just need to add a bit of color into there. It does obviously have furniture in, so uh, you can see, is the landlord renting it furnished? Full furnished apartment, so this is furnished. Now, that furniture for me wouldn't tick all the boxes for short-term rental. Uh, we're gonna need to add some bits in here, but we can probably say if we spend 1500 on top-ups, uh, we've got 1325. I think we'll probably need 500 quid just to get some feature walls painted and kitted out. Uh, so our total costs are going to be 13.25. The rent is 13.25. Now we want might want to we'll we'll leave it in there. Obviously we're going to try and negotiate it, but we will leave it in for now. Um, let's have a look. So advertising and marketing. So this is if you're going to advertise them on say properties like Open Rent. They charge 29 pound per listing for three months. Um, if we were going to then advertise the property on there, uh, which we would, we'd put that in there. Um, the uh, rates, council tax. Now, all of these costs here, I get a lot of questions all the time of how do I work it out? Is there any websites? Just the main thing to do is think about what it costs you to live in your property and then just kind of times it up or times it down depending on the size. Say if you live in a two bed and you're analyzing a one bed, you know, just discount the cost by maybe 10% and you're probably going to come out with you know the right way and then similarly go the other way. So for argument's sake, I'm just going to put some numbers in here um and kind of uh see, see where we get so for the uh, repairs and maintenance i'm just going to leave for now and uh, now depending on how you run your company is going to dictate how you uh, fill this next bit in so whether you're going to use virtual assistance obviously on a rent to rent deal are you going to get insurance yes or no you don't necessarily need any i personally don't uh, because all you can do is get contents insurance and i think it's a waste of money uh, you're going to need to replace furniture over time anyway with wear and tear the odds of it getting stolen completely, albeit I have had an apartment um, uh, robbed uh, twice actually uh, in within the space of a, of a few weeks, uh, but that's a different story for another day and I will come on to it. However, the furniture that was in there was probably two and a half grand's worth. It's the only issue I've had in four years of doing this across hundreds of properties. So had I been paying an insurance on each and every property for the last four years, I'd be well out of pocket. For me, uh, it's not worth it. Channel managers, all that sort of stuff, um, which I am going to come on to later on. An absolute must. Depending on who you use, uh, depends on the cost. I'm just going to put in some very uh, rough costs here, uh, depending because obviously when you've got portfolios, you get discounted rates. Um, so when you're starting out, it will be a bit higher. 
uh, again, property management fees, whether you're going to use that or not. TV licenses, um, I don't personally put them in. I think nowadays everything is smart TV, so as long as you're not running any live TV, uh, you don't necessarily need them. Obviously, that's for the UK. Telephone and internet, um, consumables for the rental units, let's say that's going to cost you 15 a month. Uh, if you've got any furniture loan repayments, so let's say, for example, you did decide to take out an percent credit card or even an APR uh, credit card, you might say, okay, well, I've spent five grand my month, over 24 months. So you divide that by 24 and that becomes your monthly payment in here. Um, again, property management fees, depending on what you do. Uh, virtual assistant so that's pretty much given us our our costs per month so you can see here uh, we're running at um, oh, just need to get rid of the mortgage payment it's doubled up there so we are running at 1704 now that many people are not going to be that registered initially uh, but once you hit thresholds you are so i think it's important to put the the, the, the number in here now you'll see the number on here is 20 percent however there are ways to uh, reduce that down and also you're not you you're if you are VAT registered you're also going to be able to claim some VAT back on certain things as well that you're using for the venture uh, you might want to put this in at about 11 percent and that'll give you probably a good average of what your actual VAT liability will be then we start going into the analysis side of things now there's two ways to run the analysis side of things you can either run it on a yearly basis or on a monthly basis the spreadsheet here runs it on a monthly basis i actually do things yearly now um, and i tend to do it in my head but um, I, for the sake of this i think it's good to, to operate on a monthly basis because funds are a lot less at the beginning so your cash flow is a bit tighter so, so you will want to know how it's going to work month by month um, so let's just say for example this was saying uh, on air dna here we were at a 57 percent occupancy so we're going to be looking at around say um 20 20 nights a month booked something like that and that's going to give us sort of a 66 percent occupancy um, so if we said the weekend uh, nights uh, sorry week weekend nights we were going to get um let's say six out of the eight booked and then we're going to get 14 weekday nights booked the average daily rate was 147 um, so that's over the course um, of the year so let's just say on a weekday we're going to get maybe a bit less uh, say 110 and on a weekend we're probably going to get a bit more so we get a total of 20 nights booked um, and then what we're gonna do is have a minimum monthly, uh, sorry, a minimum night stay. Now, this is where the game changes. If you are gonna run apartments like these, small one bedders, you're gonna have a lot of turnovers, okay? Your guest type is typically gonna be someone staying for two, maybe three days, weekenders, short work trips, and you're not really going to attract any longer style states. If you operate my model, which I advocate you do, where you go into larger houses, then you will attract longer bookings. You will therefore increase your average stay length and ultimately reduce your costs down. And this is another benefit of the model. But for the sake of this, I'm going to put an average of three night minimum stay. And as you'll see here, it starts to calculate the data through. Now, the cleaning cost, um, no, it depend on your location will depend on how much it's going to cost so let's just say for example to turn a one bed apartment over might cost us um let's say yeah let's say 50 quid um you will get cleaners a bit cheaper than that but i'm just going on the high side here and then your linen fee i find that linen is there or thereabouts the same as, as the cleaning uh, is a good way to, to put it in uh, so we'll say 40 quid for a, a full linen turnover if you run hired linen uh, if not, you might be less because you're going to have a wash linen. I am going to come on the difference between hired and um, uh, purchased, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say, uh, in a second. So bear with me on that and hopefully that you can then make some decisions on how you're going to run your linen going forward. We've got two and a half grand gross revenue. OTA commissions have calculated at 194. We've got running costs of 238. We've got a VAT of 262. So this is going to lose 50 quid a month. So for me, this is not a deal. All right. Now, again, like the BRR calculator, we can go back and say, okay, well, what does it need to be to make it work? So if we were to pay 900 quid a month rent, 
Do we then start going into profit? We do, 421 pounds, albeit still low and still very high risks. I would want to be focusing more on seeing these figures 750 and above. And to do that, you're gonna have to go into larger properties. There's no doubt about it. Or you're in a very unique property somewhere is maybe say a two bed in the Cotswolds. You're gonna have much higher, um, ADR and you're going to have a much higher profit margin. But in the main, where you get high ADRs, you tend to get obviously higher rents. So uh, that's where the larger properties come into play because you get more, more per property per night and you don't necessarily need to be as occupied. What this then does is you've then got occupancy and rates. So if you're using, say, a tool like AirDNA, you come down here, you can see here how the months of the year uh, reflect uh, different occupancy levels and you can use this to then work out what you need to put in uh, this is pretty much set what i think it will be for a uk season uh, and then you'll see how your profit would run throughout the course of the year and then you've got in terms of how long it's going to take to pay your initial set of costs back based on the profitability of the unit here. This example here is gonna take five months to pay it back. Then we go into five months of profit. So year one profit is a shy 4K. Then we go into 7K. And then naturally you're gonna get better at hosting and your average daily rates are gonna go up. Hopefully you can lock in your rents. So years you know, three, four, five, you should incremental um, add the profit. So you know, 5%, 10%, whatever it might be. Uh, as you get better as an operator, you get more efficient with your costs. Um, then like to think that you, you earn more profit. And again, the more reviews you've got, the more trust you've got with guests, the more repeat bookings, um, the more the, the less OTA bookings that you use, the more profit that's going to go into the deals. That's how I analyze um, a property and for whether it's for, for buying or whether it's for rent to rent. And it's it takes all the emotion out of the investment. What I'm doing here is I'm making sure that I'm just looking at the figures. You'll see a lot of stuff here, the green and red lights. It's sort of saying yes or no. So for me, I'd say, OK, well, I want um, my money back out no later than month six. So therefore, if this is red all the way down here, it's not a good deal. So if we go back to the original 1325 rent and we pop that in there, you'll see here that this will more than likely yeah, be red the whole way through. So that's not a good deal. So we just move on. We either negotiate to a price that works for us or we just move on and find a different deal. There's plenty of deals out there. There's plenty of landlords. Do not get hooked into one emotionally into it, especially on your first deal. I just need to get one over the line and you end up taking a bad deal and it end up costing you money. Um, what you can do here as well is put notes of rejected um, or accepted and it will uh, go green or red to um, to let you know. And again, you can then just go back, same on the BRR analysis, there's, there's a column there to, to have where you're at. So you can easily identify which deals you've taken on, which deals you need to go back to and revisit. And you're just building up a constant pipeline tracker. What we'll do now is we'll dive into uh, where we can actually find these properties. I mentioned here before, we've got open rent. Great way to contact landlords direct. Plenty of properties in most locations. Have a, a good search around. We can put our criteria in like you can with most of these property portal websites. Put your, your different price brackets in. You might know that, okay, well, I need to find, say, a uh, three-bed house, but it needs to be between probably um, 1,000 and 1,500 to make it work. Uh, so we update uh, within five miles of uh, Manchester, we can obviously go deeper whether you want furnished or unfurnished. Again, depending on your budget, you might want to just try and focus on furnished properties because you might not have that much setup cost. We then look at that, it gives us our options, um, and we can then go you know, through all the different uh, options here two beds, one beds. Again, I'm looking for higher, um, so you probably put three or four bed filter in there and it would, it would, it would swallow it down. And then it is just a case of getting on the phone, uh, speaking to landlords and giving them what I call the magic 15 pitch, which again, I'm going to come on to uh, later in the video, if you stick with us. And we've also got many other websites uh, that probably people don't, don't think about too much, but these free classified websites, anybody that is advertising properly on these websites for me are desperate. So they are good people to speak to. So again, if we go to rent and to sell, you know, you can look at both. Um, people that are selling property on Gumtree typically want to add, uh, avoid fees from agents. We've got um, here, you can actually go to filters and you want to get rid of the agents. So you'll see down here, any agency private, we want to select private. And then again, you want to go into filters of minimum bedrooms three, uh, no maximum. And 
and then just hit the search button and see where we get with this. You'll see we've got 1200 ads here. Obviously this is the whole of the United Kingdom. So you then obviously refine it down. But you know, for the sake of the example, I'm just kind of showing you that there is plenty of opportunity here. And again, you just click in, either message them or just pick the phone up and speak to them. Is this still available? And then obviously we go into the Magic 15 pitch. If it's for rent, obviously if it's for sale, um, it's a bit of an easier pitch. We just want to kind of come and view it. When's it available? So on and so forth. So uh, you've got Gumtree, you've got Open Rent uh, in Dubai, you've got Bayou and Dubizzle, uh, very similar websites, Property Finder. And again, there's the search filters for just landlords, uh, which you can you can find and get direct. Um, we then have Facebook. I think uh, Facebook is a wonderful platform where you can find deals on Facebook because I definitely built a lot of my business on Facebook. And I think not only getting the brand out there and you know putting a lot of social posting out there and documenting my journey, uh, which I think is hugely important, but also uh, actually going into these type of groups and finding deals. You know, I found a lot of deals on Facebook, made a lot of connections on Facebook, and it, it really does work. Okay, so on Facebook, uh, you've got loads of groups. Let's just say um, Manchester by rent. And you go to uh, groups. And you'll see here you've got apartments for sale, rent Manchester, uh, property for sale, rent Manchester. Got lots of members in these groups. Got discussions. And you'll see here single double bed apartments, people you know listing stuff. I have a five bedroom house which will come up in, in Salford, so on and so forth. So what you want to do here is obviously just scroll through again. You can search with a magnifying glass here, and you could type in four bed house or whatever any keywords. But say this guy here, um, he's got this, uh, we wanna have a look at that. What you would do is uh, comment, I've sent you a DM, because if you just go and send this person a message uh, here, it will go in their spam folder more than likely because you're not friends, they don't know you. So they will never pick that up. But if you then comment, I've sent you a DM here, they're gonna get a notification on their phone. So then they will go, so-and-so has commented on your post in this group. They're naturally gonna go to the post and then they'll see I've sent you a DM. They'll then go to their DMs and realize it'll be in there spam and then obviously the, the, you get connected so you get a much more um a much greater hit rate uh, when you do it that way there's also other ways to do it where um you could put something like this i call these call out posts and uh, we go fishing basically i am looking for a three bed in say salford for example um any landlords oh can't spell uh, any landlords Got anything available, please DM or comment below. And then what I would do is I put it in um, the big sort of purple font and I would post that. Now, they don't know whether you're an agency, what you're trying to do with the property. At this stage, you're just sticking your, your bait in the water, should we say. And then anybody that comments, you know that they're going to be landlords. You will get agents. And that's fine. Just ring them as well. Tell them what you're trying to do. Uh, but you will also get landlords as well. And this is a great way to uh, you know, find deals. You're also not being spammy in the group. You're not uh, pitching anything. Uh, so hopefully the, the posts get posted and then you will get responses. And the more you do of this, uh, the more hunting around you do, the more um, obviously bits of bait that you drop in the water across all the different platforms. You can do this in LinkedIn groups and things like that as well uh, on, your, on your social medias. Uh, you will get people coming out. Also probably got people already on your social media, uh, friends, family that don't know you're in property at this stage, but they have property and they're more than likely going to trust you from day one. So it's an easier way in or they will know somebody. Again, you could just put uh, here. Um, Does anyone know anyone with a property to rent in, again, Manchester um, 25 and, and their question mark body that might know somebody might comment and go yeah i do my sister's got one my friend's got one whatever and this can be on your own profile but also on random groups so get as much bait as you can in the water and you will start getting some bites and then from that you need to get them into a dm conversation so if anybody comments again you just write reply i've sent you a dm don't just dm them it's really important that you don't miss that step out because we want them to know that you've sent them a message and then you'll get into conversation with them and ultimately hopefully you'll start getting some deals through for me that's obviously where we can find deals for both sales and rentals obviously there's many other options as well we do have 
other areas where we can look. Google search is obviously another way. Uh, we can just you know put it into Google and see what comes up there. Obviously networking, uh, getting boots on the grounds, just going actually spending a half a day, maybe Saturday morning. Just go wander down your high street, find a load of estate agencies, just drop in, tell them who you are, tell them what you're doing, ask them if they've got anything. And again, build those relationships. My personal opinion is you want to get direct to landlords and I think you're better off focusing your time on your laptop doing things like I just showed you with the websites and the Facebook. We've also got on Facebook as well, um, you do have Marketplace, which again is a, a, a good tool. So just this little house button at the top here. And again, you can just put in uh, property for rent here and put your criteria in and it will filter them through. And then you can send messages direct to these people. At this stage, you're just wanting to ask, is it available? And from that, you will then go into the conversation around the Magic 15, which I'm going to show you on the rent to rent side of things. Obviously, if it's for sale, is it available? Um, you know, I'm a cash buyer. I'm ready to go. Don't worry about whether you are or aren't you a cash buyer at this stage. If you're using bridging funding, it's as good as cash and you will be able to get a deal over the line much quicker and there's no chain either. So you are very, very appealing to any potential uh, vendor that's looking to sell their property. So that's the deal analysis section. Uh, hopefully that's detailed enough and giving you a bit of an insight as to where you can go and find deals. And uh, it is very much about action. You've got to put a lot of viewings in. You've got to put a lot of networking and relationship building in to get your deals, but you will get them if you do do that. Um, next up, we're going to cover area setup. So once you've got your deals, obviously you need to be ready to go. So we'll dive into that now and I'm going to show you how you set up uh, for any given area, how to find your team and make sure that you're rent ready, should we say, uh, the minute that you get those keys. So for the area set up, the, the main thing that we need to get nailed is the cleaners. Now your cleaners are your number one priority. Every bad guest or every good guest will comment something about the cleaning. It is the biggest thing that lets short-term rental businesses down. And one of the reasons why I hire my own team, because I like to have full control. Um, you will have to use agencies at the beginning, but have it in your mind that you want to get your own cleaners on the books as quick as you can. And therefore that means you need to scale this portfolio so that you've got the money to pay for them and obviously enough work to give them. But in the beginning, you're gonna to need to use agencies just like we all do. So where do you find them? Uh, main Google, uh, just type in Cleaners Manchester, for example, sticking with um, the area that we're talking about here for the analysis. And you will come up with various different ones. Have a look at the reviews, read the reviews, make some phone calls, see how responsive they are. If they're not responsive to a sales lead, they're probably not going to be that responsive. So therefore, they're not a good cleaner to use. Recommendations are probably the most important thing you can do. The downside is if you go into a short term rental group and ask for a recommendation, the chances are you're not going to get many because people don't want to give their cleaners up because the more time that someone's cleaning for somebody else, the less time they've got for them. It is a bit like a sort of you know, holy grail secret. People like to, to keep hold of their cleaners contacts and not give them out. So you've got to go and find them. And it is a very much a case of kissing a lot of frogs to find your prince or princess. And my point of view, I've been through a lot of cleaners and the good ones, the bad ones, but if you get let down by a cleaner, it's going to destroy your short term rental business overnight. So you really need to make sure you've got everything in play to find the best cleaners, make sure you're working with them, make sure you're training them as well, because there's a big difference between cleaning a house for say every day you and me uh, once a week, you know, where they're not cleaning fridges, they're not necessarily checking for hairs in beds, they're not emptying drawers checking under the beds to make sure that there's no let's say weekend items left over you know i've had it all in this game but the worst thing you need is your next guest to walk into that so you need someone who is specialized in deep cleaning short-term rental properties and if they haven't i'm not saying don't necessarily hire them but then you need to make sure you give them a checklist maybe go on the first few cleans with them so they fully understand how you want to work and how they need to work and also how they're going to report in every single time that they do a clean so you've got eyes and ears on that property so for me put a lot of effort into finding your cleaners up front maybe you know set half a day aside full list grill them interview them uh, meet them 
uh, check their work because it's time well invested into your business. The last thing you want to do is put all of the hard work into the analyzing, finding deals, pitching landlords, getting contracts, getting those keys. And then your first review is a bad review because of the cleaning. And then your next review is a bad review because of the cleaning. Your property will not fly. It will just get pushed further and further down the rankings of the online travel agents and you will get no bookings. You'll start losing money and it's over before you've even started. So really focus on the cleaners and get them boxed off first and foremost. Next up is the maintenance team. Now, it's difficult to do this when you first start out because obviously, You've got no work to give somebody. So yeah, you could ring a load of people and say, what do you do? And are you okay if I put you in my black book and I call you whenever I've got a problem? I'm setting up this short-term rental business, so I am gonna need you know, a plumber, I'm gonna need a handyman. They're typically the two main things that you do need. Uh, it's very rare that you get too many electrical faults or anything that a handyman can't do. It's typically door handles falling off, uh, boilers stop working, uh, every now and then you might get cooker doesn't work or the lock box uh, is jammed or the digital lock's not working. So again, a handyman is probably the main person you need to find here. Uh, find out what rates they charge, find out how much notice they need, find out if they can do emergency call outs and you want to identify two or three and then you want to be using them. Now, again, you want to build your own maintenance team over time because as I've mentioned uh, previously in many of my videos, if we have a problem and you don't regularly use someone, then you're not on their priority list. So if you ring somebody now today and say, oh, I've got the short term rental property, um, the guests locked out, is there any chance that you could um, you know, go and take a look at it? Then they're probably gonna be like, oh, well, we're busy. We've got these regular clients that we're currently dealing with. You know, So you might then need to make five, six, seven phone calls before you find a guy that's not busy. Now, the guy that's not busy is obviously a worrying sign if everybody else is busy because it means they're probably not that good at their job or they're not that reliable or they've, again, a bit like your cleaners, let people down and therefore they've got bad reviews and they're not getting enough business or maybe they're just lazy. But when you've got your own team, you can just make one phone call like we do. We, we ring head of maintenance, Daniel, and we just say, we've got this problem. He'll then, either himself or he'll either whichever team member, we get in the vans, we go and get a sort of jobs done. It's one phone call from ops, it's one job done, and we know it gets done. The efficiency of that is huge, and obviously the benefit of that to your, to your portfolio is immense. But you obviously have to start somewhere, and you've got to just try and build relationships. So try not to hop around Find one handyman, again, try and get referrals from friends, family, colleagues. You might have had someone work on your own house, uh, do something for you on that front. Try and use somebody that you've got a relationship with or certainly build a relationship with someone quickly. Try and give them a lot of work. So try and give them some of the setup work. Um, you know, try and give them uh, a bit of, a bit of um, you know, work here, there and everywhere, even if it's just for your house or whatever, just to keep that relationship going because then they will treat you as a priority. And when you really need somebody, they'll go out and they will help. So that's the next thing that you do need to get locked down. And then the final thing uh, really for your area setup is linen and what you're going to do with that. So I'm going to show you kind of the two options that you do have. Option number one is obviously uh, purchased linen. So this is where you are going to obviously go out and purchase the linen. Now, you will typically have obviously in the property, you're going to have three sets of linen. You're gonna have one set here, which is always on the bed, okay? You're then gonna have another set here, which is at the laundrettes, and then you're gonna have another set here, which is the spare. Now, these rotate, so what will happen is you'll go out and you'll buy these three sets of linen. I would actually advocate that you get a fourth set, and this is kept in your house or in your storage facility, because they get stained, they get damaged, they go missing. You believe it, how many pillows go missing? But what we wanna do is make sure that we're never left short. So we've got this cycle, so we've got one on the bed, and then we've always got one at the, the laundrettes, and then we've got the spare. So the cleaner arrives to clean the property. They will obviously take the one off the bed, and they'll bag it up to take to the laundrette. We have the spare that goes out the cupboard onto the bed, 
And then obviously the one that's in the laundrette gets picked up when we drop off the dirty and then that goes back into the spare. So that's one way that you do do it. Now, what you do need to do here, there will be four times sets of linen to purchase up front, which can be quite an outlay of expense uh, from day one. You will typically, if you buy good quality linen, get maybe, I don't know, 100 washers from it, assuming that it doesn't get damaged. Now, I've had it all over the years. We've had clearly fights in the properties. There's blood all over. We've had people have wet the bed. Um, we've had um, makeup all over them, uh, fake tan. It does destroy the linen. So be prepared if you're going to run this purchased option that you are going to need to be topping it up. So that then adds an extra problem of who tops it up? How do you go and get it? How do you get it back to the property? There are some pros of doing this, um, which is over time you might save money than just renting it um, each and every turn, but you are also gonna add increased probably hassle by doing it this way because you're then responsible for making sure it's topped up and make sure that you've got enough linen. Comes back to the relationship you've got with your cleaners, you need them to be identifying what you're short of every single time they go in. So have we got a full set of linen here? Have we got a full set of linen here? Have we got a full set here? Or has someone taken the pillow here and therefore we're one pillowcase short as well and if they then take the pillow again and again all of a sudden we're left with maybe not enough pillowcases to be able to run this cycle and then your next guest is left short or you're gonna have to go out and find some or get it delivered on amazon to maybe your cleaner then your cleaner's got to go to the property but they're going to charge you for it so you've got to think about all of the different scenarios but that's what's going to happen if you purchase your linen now on the other side we then have hired and this is my preferred option. So with the high ed, it's very simple. What you do uh, each and every week is uh, this is your mobile phone. You make a phone call uh, to the company that you are using and you will say to them, I need X, Y, Z stock and I need it for this location, this location, this location, this location. Now, depending on you, how you run it and how they run, they may go to each individual property. And what they will do is they will just let themselves in and then they will uh, put it in your storage box uh, or your um, cupboard that you've got locked. Side note on locked cupboards and properties, depending on how you're running, but if you're running the tourism model uh, where you're going to get a lot of drunk people through, for some reason they want to break into these cupboards and see what's behind, uh, even though it's only some linen. We actually run a storage facility because we hire a lot of linen uh, in certain locations. So we will have a storage facility. So they will drop all of the houses off to the storage unit and then we get the cleaners to go to and from the units from the houses so what they will do is they'll collect the dirty linen and take it back to the storage and then this uh, goes back to the company they know they can just go in and out and then head office orders the amount of linen that we need for the cleans per week plus some extra and they will drop it off to the storage unit and then the cleaners go and retrieve the clean uh, we have somebody in the storage unit who is bagging up the linen each day and obviously saying this is for that property this is for that property this is for that property so the cleaners can just come pick up and go and then they turn the properties around and go backwards and forwards. The upside of this is any damaged linen, you've got to pay for it, don't get me wrong, but they will tell you it's damaged and therefore you can bill the guest because obviously they're going to be on your case because uh, they're wanting you know the money from you um and it's it's as long as you're working with a good company there's a constant supply of linen it's all fresh um they have to uh, clean their linen up every 100 washes or so they're gonna have to put fresh into stock so with a bit of luck you're getting good fresh linen all the time and you know what your costs are your costs are a bit more controlled because you know roughly it costs you x per turn so you can kind of build that into your cleaning and linen fee and then it just kind of rotates through so you can't always um run this option i know uh, when we used to operate uk wide uh, say liverpool for example uh, we used to struggle to find someone that would run this model um, so it doesn't always work sometimes you have to run this model but you will hopefully by the, the end of this you understand how it works and decide which way you want to go you could look into companies and get some prices and see if that's going to work see if they will drop off to the individual house let themselves in uh, and then obviously collect the dirties one of the downside of 
hired linen uh, if you are running it in each and every property is the dirties do tend to just get put back in the cupboard from the cleaners and if you're only getting a once a week pickup for example from uh, the lawn the laundry company that's that you're renting from it can start to smell and one of the biggest things that guests pick up on when they first walk into a property is the smell just a little side note there you might want to make sure you get some diffusers and make your property smell nice with the laundrette option here uh, again you might not necessarily need to take it to a laundrette you could just say to your cleaner how much extra would you charge me to take it home and wash it and they will give you a price and that might just work as well side note on that one is if you do fall out with your cleaners um, and they've got linen at their property, then you're probably going to struggle to get it back. Um, we've had many occasions where, you know, cleaners have let us down. They've taken our linen as ransom. And this will happen as you scale. Uh, you will go through cleaners. Um, they, as I said in, you know, before, they will jump for a pound an hour to somebody else. Uh, you've got very little control over them. Uh, but, you know, even working with the good ones, the good ones turn not so good as they get their feet under the table and get comfortable. So you just got to be prepared that, you know, your linen may, may go missing. Also, if they are working for other short-term rental companies, then uh, they may, if they fall short and they need to make sure that they're not going to let the guests down, they do sometimes uh, take linen from your spare and use it on another with the intention of bringing it back, but then sometimes it doesn't come back and then you're here. So it can become a bit of an administrative nightmare and also uh, just a headache that you don't really need. For me, if you can, I'd go the hired option, but again, it's not for everybody, so you've got to make your decision on that one. Now, in terms of your front-end business setup, what you're going to need is a virtual phone number, there's many websites you can go on to get a virtual number the reason you want to do that is you want to separate your personal life from your business life these businesses do take up a lot of your time and you will get pestered if you give a personal phone number that being said you do typically need a, a non-virtual number for sites like airbnb to get registered sometimes the virtual numbers don't work um, so you also want to try and have a business whatsapp a lot of people like to use whatsapp these days so um, it is an idea to get a dual sim phone if you can and then put a separate uh, even if it's just a prepaid uh, so you've got whatsapp for your business and you've got a virtual phone number and they come into one side of your phone which you can switch on or off that's how i started at the beginning and it worked well for me uh, it doesn't cost that much to run a virtual number but it, it does separate your life and i think it's really important to do that and it will make sure that you're efficient you're on hand you've got everything at your fingertips and you're not going to miss a guest phone call a guest inquiry or worst case scenario a, a guest that's struggling to operate your property get into your property has a maintenance problem and it needs solving straight away because the better your communication is the better your reviews are going to be, which ultimately leads to more revenue over time. So again, just jump on Google, virtual phone number UK, virtual phone number Dubai, virtual phone number America, wherever you're looking to set up, you will find companies and just have a look through what their options are, uh, how many phone calls. You could even go one step further and get a call center if you really wanted to. I did do this, but I found that it was just prolonging the guest getting to you and the longer a guest waiting to solve a problem, because typically they only ring if they've got a problem the uh, more frustrated they were getting and ultimately the worse the reviews were becoming so i find at the beginning just set yourself out get yourself set up be prepared that you're going to take the phone calls when you're running five six seven properties and you've got too many phone calls this is maybe when you will hire your own virtual assistant who will then work for you in your business they will take the phone calls direct and then they know exactly what to do with it with your lead um, i would try and avoid external companies as much as possible and have everything in-house where you can even if it is virtual or you are only using consultants but they are working in your business i feel like it's a bet a lot better bet than just in the call center for example who is just a script it can be any old agent in there you don't have that relationship on a regular basis with them now we want to look at the negotiation side of things and why a landlord would want to rent their property to you so you can make a profit from it this is something that a lot of people seem to struggle to get around their heads but there are so many landlords out there that really embrace what we're doing see the the true value in it and can understand that it is a massive win for them versus many many tenants and turnovers and void rents and things like that so i have this thing called the magic 15 and i'm going to explain 
every single step of it for you today so that you can talk to it with your landlords or potential landlords and get them to understand why working with you is better than choosing a tenant. First one, no voids. As a company, we are going to rent the property from them. We're going to earn money from the property because we know how to analyze. We know how to make sure that we're going to pick a profitable property and we are therefore going to be able to pay that rent every single month. So as we want to rent this property for you know, three to five years, for example, we're not going to not pay the rent because if we don't pay the rent, we'll get kicked out and therefore we can't make profit. So it's in their benefit that they would work with us. Whereas with the tenant, if they decide they want to leave all of a sudden, or they might relocate somewhere else, or they might lose a job, the first thing that they stop doing is paying their rent. And in countries like the UK, where the legislation is against landlords, it can take many, many months plus, you know, expensive court battles to get a tenant out, then they're going to go months where they're going to have void periods. Also, if a landlord rents to us for, say, five years, they're going to get five years worth of rent every single month because, again, we need the property to make the profit. Whereas if they have a tenant for, say, 12 months and then that tenant leaves, there's normally going to be possibly a full week turnaround where they're going to have no rent coming in because they need to refurbish the property. They need to advertise it. They need to do some viewings. They need to get another tenant back in. And this cycle might repeat maybe two or three times over the same five year period. So let's just assume on average they're going to lose maybe two months every two years. That's at five months of rent that they're not going to get just by simply turning tenants through their properties whereas over the five years they're going to get every single month rented by ourselves now again that's assuming that their tenants pay all the time which they don't tenants are buggers and um, i've learned the hard way and the expensive way and that's why i don't have them and that's why i only have guests no voids is one of the biggest things and uh, the monetary the monetary thing for landlords is one of the biggest things that's why they get into the game to get a return on their money so the more we can show them that they're maximizing their return on their money uh, the more more inclined they are to work with you. Number two, kind of touched on um, before, we've got no turnover vacancy. So, you know, as I said, there's no turnover vacancy time when they're working with us because they're going to get continued rent. Number three, uh, no eviction headaches. I have personally been through the courts with a tenant and uh, it's not nice. Uh, it's something, it takes a lot of time up. It's very expensive because you want to get legal teams involved to make sure that it happens. And the whole thing just is, is quite stressful. Uh, this will happen if you're a landlord long enough and you've got enough properties, you will go through a bad tenant. You will go through a court process to get them kicked out of your house. You know, mine, I won the court case. They still didn't move out. I then had to go back to court. I had to then get a bailiff's order. The bailiffs went. You've then got to give them a further two weeks to get their furniture out. The whole process is a nightmare. Any landlord that has experienced this, you can tap into that emotional side of the stress and the strain and there and also the financial element of it and i guarantee you when you explain how you work and why it would benefit them based on all of these points they they will want to work with you over any tenant all day long i know i personally would given the experience that i had uh, with my two bad tenants uh, which cost me probably in excess of twenty two thousand pounds after i had to finish the refurbs on the houses after they trashed them on the way out as well never mind the, the money i didn't get on the rental side for the amount of time they were living in my property rent free before again on that no lawyer fees because they're not going to have to go to court obviously there's going to be no lawyer fees to pay which is a huge benefit my lawyer fees for the tenant that I had to kick out were in the region of about three grand uh, by the time I had paid for the bailiffs and paid for the court and all that sort of stuff. If I wanted to then track that tenant down afterwards and get my rent, which obviously I wasn't gonna, so I didn't bother. They can't pay the rent initially. Are they gonna be able to pay the rent once we put a court case on them or a CCJ or whatever? Then no, so I didn't bother, but that was gonna be another probably two and a half to three grand. So it can be a very expensive exercise if you get a bad tenant. And this is what we've got to play on because we're gonna be someone's best tenant. I guarantee it, I say it all the time and believe it because you are. Uh, number five, no viewings. So again, as you get more experienced in property, as you earn more money, you value your time a lot. Um, a landlord that's running their own property or even if they're using an estate agent sometimes the estate agents don't do viewings or sometimes they can't get there so they'll ask the landlord to do it every single time you go and do a viewing you're probably looking at 30 minutes to 60 minutes by the time you arrive there open the property up do the viewing drive back it could even be longer and as well you may or may not know but as a landlord 
there's sometimes people just don't turn up. I've had viewings in the past, in the early days when I used to do them myself, where you'd arrange them, like literally within an hour, yeah, I'll come round, and you're stood at the property, no one turns up, you try and ring them, they don't answer. Total waste of your time, very, very frustrating. Again, they're not gonna need to do any viewings because they've got one tenant, and obviously we're gonna be there for a long period of time. We need to view it once, and that is it. Number six, no tenant finders fees. Now, again, this depends uh, where you are operating. In Dubai, the tenant pays the fees, so this doesn't really stack. But in the UK, landlord pays the agency the fees. So this is why landlords do sometimes want to try and rent their properties direct on sites like Open Rent and how we can find them. But there's no tenant fees because we are going to be their tenant. And we're speaking to them direct, so there's no tenant fees. So again, coming back to that profitability over the long term, you know, if they were having to find a tenant every, say, two years, then they're going to be paying a fee to an agency every two years to find them that tenant plus the void periods plus the end of term refurbishment costs all starts to add up and ultimately it reduces their net profitability number seven there's no management fees ongoing so again because we are going to be running this as a business we are effectively managing the property as well we're going to make sure it's clean we are going to make sure that it's you know rent ready for our guests so we're keeping on top of things so there's no real need for an agency to be managing checking in making sure it's okay at the end of the day we can't run a short-term rental business by having crap all over the place greasy cookers bridges that have got mold in them and this is what happens with tenants and this is why agencies have to go and check up on tenants to make sure that you're not you not using the extractor fan in the bathroom for example and damps building up on the walls which ultimately is going to affect the property value and cause major damage, which the landlord's then gonna to have to fix. So there's no management fees. Typically, a agency will charge around 10% of the rental value per month. So again, the landlord is saving money by working for us and they're getting a much better property out of it. Number eight, um, we are going to clean at least once, if not twice, a week. Now, there's not many tenants out there that will clean a property once or twice a week some of them don't even clean it the whole time they're in there uh, but we have a business to run as i mentioned earlier the cleaning is the most important thing in this business so we need to make sure that these properties are clean it's and 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 the landlord benefits from this if you're constantly maintaining things then your property stays in a much better condition you need to spend less on getting it up to scratch or getting it up to standard when you've got you know even if we disappear in five years time and end the contract their property is still going to be in very good condition we've been cleaning it you know once twice a week for the last five years we've been doing the minor maintenance on it so we're keeping on top of the property something that tenants do not do uh, number nine any damage that is caused by guests we have their credit card on file so we can take that money from the guest and make sure that it is repaired and any minor maintenance we will also repair if say the taps leak and then normally that would be a landlord's issue but we have a guest coming in so we need to make a commercial decision so do we effectively lose the 150 200 pounds a night booking for the sake of maybe spending 70 pounds and just get it repaired versus you know having to ring the landlord and say we've got a problem he then sends his guy around three days later but by this point we've got a guest that's really upset and they're wanting compensations in the main we tend to do quite a lot of the landlord's maintenance that they typically would be contracted to do under a normal tenancy because it's a better commercial decision for ourselves number 10 uh, we want it for a long period of time because as we've analyzed earlier these things make money and we want to therefore continue to make profit so as long as they're making profit we want them uh, a tenant is not in the same sort of situation tenants can move their situations can change uh, they might you know come into some money and therefore want to buy a house they might get a better job so they they're always moving for us this is a business so as long as it's making profit we want to stay in in that property and as we are making profit over time if the landlord wants to increase the rent on us we do have the flexibility to be able to increase the average daily rate and therefore we can sometimes let them win as well as we're winning as well it is a relationship and the longer it goes on the better number 11 we can take multiple properties so a tenant can only rent one property at a time because they're living in it we need multiple properties and what you will find and this is why i talk about going on viewings to build a relationship is what you will find 
The landlords have portfolios. Once you're hooked on this, you want more. If you get one property and it's earning well and it's creating you an extra revenue, you want another one. So landlords that you meet out and about in your viewings will have multiple properties. We can rent them all. We can be their only tenant if they want and give them all of these benefits for every single property. Number 12, the average relationship of these deals is eight years. There's a good chance that we're going to take this property for eight years uh, or every single property, you know, that, that the landlord's got and is willing to work with us on. Um, you know, so again, coming back to the financial side of things, it all, you know, plays into it. I mentioned earlier that we will do minor maintenance that is re their responsibility. In terms of tax, depending on where they're located, but there are some tax benefits of working with ourselves. Um, if they wanted to potentially get into a bit more of a structured deal, uh, not so much a straightforward rent to rent, they can avoid section 24 in the UK if they are a landlord that holds these properties in their personal name because they'll be getting whacked by that tax. So they can tax relief by working with us uh, in a bit of a quirky way uh, and receiving fluctuating income rather than a guaranteed income. Um, so there is a tax benefit there that once you understand it, you can talk to landlords about. And finally, number 15, we will typically refurbish the property, which adds value. Now, as we've sort of highlighted in the analyzing section, you're going to paint feature walls. Um, I have actually put new kitchens in before. I've put new bathrooms into people's properties. I'm not probably advocating doing that. I think that there are a few rookie mistakes in that one, but sometimes it, it does pay. Now, don't get me wrong, the properties I did that for, I earned very well from, and I got my money back. Uh, but I would prefer to be just finding modernized properties ready to go now, especially on the rent to rent strategy. But we will refurbish them and, and that will increase the value. So if we're keeping it in great condition, we're making them look great, age of furniture, we're cleaning them every week, their property value will go up versus having a tenant who will abuse the property. They'll not you know, treat it with as much care. And when they get it back, they're gonna have to, it'll cost the landlord money to refurbish that property and get it back into a rent ready standard, which is ultimately hitting their pot all the time. If they're, as I said earlier, letting damp grow, bathrooms, which happens if they don't put extractor fans on. There's all sorts of things that tenants do that devalue a property. We actually help the landlord increase the value of their property. So we've discussed pitching to landlords now, I'm not a massive fan of going to estate agents. I think you waste a lot of time and it's much better to focus on finding landlords, especially for rent to rent deals. But if we are pitching agents, um, this is the key benefits that you need to look at and discuss with them. Number one, you will pay them a renewal fee. Biggest thing that agents don't want to work with us is the fact that they think that we're going to steal their client and they're going to lose out on the renewal revenue. You've got to remember every time they put a tenant into their property, they're getting a renewal fee or they think they're going to lose out. So we've got to put a deal together that gives them their renewal fee. Number two, you've got to build trust with them. Okay. They're going to have clients that they've worked with for years and they don't want to lose that relationship with them by putting a bad tenant in. So you're the tenant, remember, they don't know who you are at this stage. They probably see Airbnb as you know, properties getting trashed, this, that, and the other. So you've got to be able to make them trust you so that they can maintain their relationship with their landlords that some of them might have worked with for years. And this is one of the biggest things why they sometimes don't want to work with short-term rental companies because they don't quite understand the model. And there's obviously the horror stories to go with it as well. So trust is, is one of the biggest things you've got to get across to a state agents because they are the middleman between the two parties. Next thing is multiple commissions. You can rent many properties. So for them, you want to tell them that you're not just going to be one tenant and you're never going to see them again, or it'll be 12, 18 months before you come back and find your next property. You can take properties from them all the time. And if they work with you, you can put multiple commissions into their bank balance every single month. This is something that you need to play on, especially with the agents. And it, it does work if, if, if you've got a hungry agent that's after commission and they can see how easy it would be dealing with one company. Number four, um, top tip on this is don't waste time with uh, large agencies. So your big agency is not worth it. What you want to do is try and find your solace operators. Maybe they've got one agency in your town. Uh, it's an owner run business. And ideally you want to go in and you want to be speaking to the owner. They are going to be more inclined because every single month they're struggling to pay their salaries. If they can get some extra income or they can get deals that are going to be, be constantly flowing out the door and they can date landlords, we can get your properties rented within 24 hours of listing with us. They're more inclined to work with you because they can see the benefit. The larger agencies that have got lots of stock, they're getting lots of commissions, multi-million pound businesses, stay away from them. It's very rare that you'll punch through. 
And the final point on that is to get out on the ground. I mentioned it earlier in the video, but going out on the high street through or wherever your estate agencies are located, going in, having a conversation with them, sitting down, having a coffee, explaining your model, building the trust and building that relationship. And over time, you will get deals. Working with agents, it's not just going to happen overnight. You've got to invest a lot of time and effort into building relationships and building trust with them. But when you do identify two to three agents that you want to work with, then they will work with you. And that's all you need. They will give you enough deals to rent and get set up and get your journey going. And that is really all you're going to need from an agency's point of view. Okay, so next up, I want to talk about the different types of contracts that you're going to need as you run your service accommodation business. Now, I'm not going to cover the purchasing of assets because typically those contracts will be led by your solicitors. But in the main, we're going to have a rent to rent contract. We're going to have a management agreement if you decide to go into property management. And obviously, you're going to have your guest contract. So first and foremost, on the rent to rent side of things, this is a contract that you're going to have to be able to rent a property from a landlord. And it's different from a tenancy agreement in many ways, because as a company, you're going to be renting the property, not as an individual. And you're also going to be using the property for commercial purposes. So therefore, a normal tenancy agreement doesn't necessarily do the job. So the key things that you need to have in this contract are time frames of the rental agreement now the typical contract is around three to five years now that sounds like a long period of time to commit to if you don't know what you're doing however you want to make sure that you've got the property for a long period of time so it gives you the chance to not only recoup your initial investment cost in the furniture potential decoration but then to obviously make some profit thereafter now as i've explained many times and as we work through the deal analyzer you'll see that my point is around six to seven months that i want my cost to be paid back and then that will give me a further two and a half or four and a half years to then make some good profit out of the property. The last thing you want to do is invest in a property and then the landlord tear the contract up after six months or after 12 months and we haven't really had time to get our profit back out and pay the investment cost back. So timeframes are really important. Now, you also want to put in a clause that gives you the flexibility to get out. Now, I typically have a three month notice period. If things go south or the property just isn't working, then you want to try and get out of that property. Now, some landlords will agree to this and some won't. It just depends on the situation that you're in and the landlord that you're dealing with, but it's worth having the conversation and it's always worth trying to throw in a term that suits you and not them on this front. If they pick up on it, then it needs to be discussed. If they don't, happy days, it's in the contract and it's gonna benefit you going forward if the economy turns against you the property stops working or something happens to you or your business you know you want to have flexibility but in order to get a discounted rent or a fixed rent for a long period of time at a lower rate which will benefit your profitability on a good property sometimes you need to commit to a bit more of a longer contract with these landlords you've got to work that out between yourself there's no straightforward i might rule on this it is very much you're going to speak to the landlord or the agency you're going to come to terms that suit both parties and then from that you'll form an agreement the other main things that I like to have in the contracts and I think are really important and they're quite overlooked at the beginning because at the beginning it's like you first meet somebody, it's all great, you go on lots of dates and everything's fine. It's not until you start living together that you start realizing the niggles and how they annoy you and things like that. And it's the same with any sort of landlord relationship. At the beginning, it's all good because you're both trying to help one another solve a problem. But then as the relationship goes forward, it gets a bit sour, especially towards the end. If one person person wants the property back or you want to give it back then that tends to be not on the terms of the other person they've then got the hassle of sorting everything out so things can start to go a bit sour my experience teaches me that there's a few things you need to cover your backs on and one is wear and tear of the property a lot of landlords are expecting properties back in a same or similar condition to what they gave it to you with and that's understandable and that's fair but they have to anticipate wear and tear on the property. They can't expect, especially if it's furnished, for example, if they're putting furniture in there, you're renting it as a furnished property, they are gonna have to expect that there's two to three years worth of wear and tear on that furniture. And there's absolutely no way in the world that you can give them that property back in the same condition because of you know wear and tear, it happens. Things like damaged walls and painting and all that sort of stuff, yes, you can cover that back up, but again, cupboard hinges or bath shower heads things like that they are going to have natural wear and tear and i think it's really important that you detail the specifics of wear and tear in every contract you have with the landlord because as i said at the beginning 
just putting maintenance of these items or a certain value is what we'll cover and you cover. That is okay for the start and for the operation as you're running it. But at the end, when it comes to getting your deposit back, then you're going to need to justify that. No, we agreed that there was a, allowed this much wear and tear or these items we were expecting to degrade over time. And we've agreed that at the beginning. And that will ensure that you can get your money back. And then obviously you can move on to another unit. And the final major point. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot more points that need to go into these rent to rent contracts. However, the final point that I think is really important is if you're trying to get a three or five year period locked in, you want to try and lock the rent in. So you know exactly how much it's going to cost you and then you know what your operational costs are going to be thereafter. If you don't and you don't have any, or even if you say, okay, well, I'll agree a 2% increase per year, at least you know where you're at from day one. What you don't want to do is be running a, a successful operation. And I had this, uh, where, well, several times in the last few years, but one of the main ones that I can remember is I was paying 850 rent on a property. It was working well for us, generating sort of 45 grand a year on average for the three year period that we had it. it was a large house, a five bed house. And all of a sudden he now wanted 1500 a month. Now you'll say, okay, well, that's still going to make me profit as long as we keep those averages. But the fact that they wanted to double the rent on me and basically abuse what was going on in the market, it didn't really sit well with me. And I didn't think that was a win-win relationship. So I came out of that property, even though I gave up a lot of profit, I came out of it because there were things that they hadn't done that again, coming into the, the maintenance agreements and the wear and tears. And they were just thinking of the money side and not the relationship side. And I think that's an important lesson to also learn and, and understand is it's not always just about the money you want to be working with landlords that are in it for the long term with you you can build relationships with and you work well together so for me make sure that in the in the contract there is a rent increase this is one of my first agreements so naturally i didn't have that in the contract and when the three-year term expired this is what they hit me with and i had to make a decision one way or another i decided to come out of that property because i just didn't think that they'd um thought about the relationship they didn't think about the money i'd given them over the three years and listen i might have made a wrong decision but that was my decision at the time had i had a contract in place then i might have been able to cover myself and i might still have that property we just don't know okay so if you're wanting to go into property management, which I think is a great addition to these type of business models, and we've talked about it already in this video, there are certain things you're gonna have to cover. And for me, this is where you really need to get your contract ironed out. I would say my property management agreement is a contract that I have tweaked more and more and more as I've gone through my journey managing other people's properties. Because not only are you dealing with a guest, but you're also dealing with an owner. And both can be very tricky at times. And what you have to really pay attention to is how much time you're spending on both of these types of people to be able to then facilitate your business and is it worthwhile doing. So your contract details exactly what they're going to get. They know what they're getting into and you can also refer back to it if things aren't quite going the right way between the relationship between both parties. First and foremost is the notice period that you have. Now, I would advocate that you should at least have a minimum of a three month notice period. At the beginning, you might not think that it takes much time to run these things and you might see it as a no risk capital gain because obviously the investment costs not there to set a property up, you're just taking it on. But the time it takes to actually list a property from start to finish is roughly four to five hours. Now, if you're taking on a a lot of stock, then that time is going to be taken up just listing properties, never mind managing the guests and everything else. What you don't want to do is spend four or five hours getting it all listed, then dealing with all the owner inquiries, dealing with all the onboarding, contract issues, etc. etc. And then for them to pull the plug within 30 days. In that period, you might not have even earned any money, especially if you're onboarding the property in a down season. So for me, you want to try and get a minimum of three months. Now you can be flexible with your contracts, you can decide side however you want to do it yourself but for me I, I want three months because I think that justifies the work we have to put in up front now there are some companies that will charge an admin fee to get properties on boarded and get them set up but I don't I, I would rather just have the property build a long-term relationship and make the money from operating that property I think personally that works best and that's the model you should adopt but it is entirely up to yourself in the contract you want to be detailing the charges that they're responsible for you do not want them to have any nasty surprises on their first statement so depending on how you run
run your model. You might say that they're going to charge for the cleaning, the linen, and the turnovers. Or you might say the guest's going to cover that and you work out what your guest fee is and you, you add that into your booking. Whatever it is, you just want to have it detailed to the penny. Even down to things like, you know, they, they need to pay their own VAT. They need to be responsible for, you know, maybe OTA charges. However it works in your business and what you see fit, you want to just make sure it's in the contract so that when they get their first monthly statement, they know, okay, that's what I agreed. There's no surprises here and there's going to be less questions because if you don't do that, you're going to get more questions, which takes up more of your time. And then it stops you focusing on the income generating tasks, which for me is one of the biggest killers in most property management businesses. If you don't get it right, you will end up just soaking all your time up trying to facilitate people rather than actually growing your business and working on your business. And that is a recipe for disaster. And you're certainly not going to scale at the speed that you would like to. One of the other things that I think is really important, especially in, say, destinations like Dubai, a bit more so than, say, the UK, is when owners have properties or apartments in holiday specific destinations, they are going to either want to use them themselves or possibly rent them out to families or allow them families to stay in, in the units. Now, all well and good and at the beginning obviously you don't want to take that away from an owner but as we have experienced if you don't set guidelines and boundaries of how many days they can have for free or what the charges would be if say for example they put a family member in for 30 days and they weren't taking any money because there's still potentially going to be you're going to have to sort the cleaning out you may if there's any maintenance issues have to sort them out there's still a bit of work that's going to have to be done but more at the point you don't want to be losing the revenue so as i mentioned earlier it takes quite a bit of time to onboard all these properties but then if you get an owner that then puts in 60 days worth of owner bookings then you're not going to make any money for the first probably 60 90 days and you've put all the hard work in you've got your software cost to run it on a monthly basis and it's just not fair so for me i think it's important that you stipulate that yes owners can have their own bookings however they can only have a certain amount of free days a year and that, that is something that i've learned over time operating more so in dubai than in the uk but i think it is relevant in both contracts and especially if you're operating in a holiday destination you want to make sure that you have enough availability i know there's companies say specialize in the lake district in the uk and i know they do the same thing where we'll manage your property for you but you can only have a maximum of two weeks a year or three weeks a year and depending on how many weeks they want they change the rate so if you only take say one week we might only charge you 15 percent if you take three weeks a year we might charge you 17 and a half percent and that again is not a bad model because then obviously you're earning on the months that you've got it and you're earning more depending on how much they want to to use it themselves so you're not at a loss and i think it's really important to sort of have a look at what other people are doing and see what see the good things and especially the bigger companies quite easy to get hold of their contracts have a read through them they are further ahead than you they're further ahead than me they've experienced these issues that i've now experienced in the last couple of years didn't have in the contract initially but now do have in the contract so really important to stipulate what the owner's booking policy is from day one so everybody is clear on it the next thing is obviously your payout time frame. So when are you going to pay the owners out? Is it going to be weekly? Is it going to be monthly? If so, on what date? And when can they expect the money by after the payments are made? I think, again, this stops the questions of when am I getting my money? And what you want to try and do in these property management businesses is eliminate the noise. And it's really important that you work hard to do it through either automation or clear and precise instructions to everybody so everyone knows where they stand. So we set a date of the 17th of the following month, and that's when we pay we get all the statements issued before then and there's no doubt about that and that happens that helps keep everything ticking smoothly and obviously it stops my team getting bombarded with questions all the time now one thing that you all saw and i think this is really crucial is having a refund policy that is in your contracts so we have 10 percent. so if we have a guest that is being problematic we know that they're just not going to go away or something the owner hasn't done in the property that they said they were going to do we will have an automatic 10 percent of the booking value refund policy so that stops us having to you know go to the owner for permission to give them a refund or potentially annoying a guest by not giving them 
what they want if they you know if they're unhappy and we're saying oh we're pushing back because of the owner because ultimately the reviews stand on your account and this is really important your account is the one that will get hit so if you take on substandard properties or you take on properties that landlords are not going to keep maintained then your review scores are going to suffer now that one property especially on accounts like airbnb where it's all one account under your brand name your average score will start to drop and then it will start to affect the rest of your properties not just that one property so what you don't want is one bad landlord dragging your whole portfolio down and ultimately you will then start losing other management clients as well so we have a 10 percent no questions asked give back policy they will see that in their resolution charges on their statements and they can't argue with that because it's in the contract from day one and again it's about setting clear expectations but being able to also protect your business as well at the same time and on that note as well you also want to look at the amount of maintenance spend that you're allowed to do without the owner's permission now this might sound crazy but if you have a guest in stay the last thing you want to do is let's say it's a 50 pound fix or a 100 pound fix the last thing you want to have to do is ring the landlord get their permission before you can send anybody out at the same time this is all happening the guests getting more and more frustrated that nothing's getting done about it. especially if you know you're, you're dealing with busy landlords they might not have their phones they might be in meetings you might take five six hours to get hold of them that is not a reliable solution to be able to keep your guest happy and keep your business moving forward remember what i just said about your business being impacted in terms of the review score if you cannot keep that guest happy so i tend to have a maximum spend in the contract so we will say we can spend a maximum of 250 pounds without your permission and this is obviously to deal with the guests now some landlords are a bit reluctant to this because they think you're just going to spend their money willy-nilly but that's where the relationship comes in and that's where they have to trust that you're only going to do it if it's absolutely necessary Sorry, we treat their properties like our properties and their money like our money and if you do that and you keep the costs tight then the landlord is going to be happy but it is important that you get this clause in play and it might you might start off with 50 quid you might start off with 100 quid it doesn't matter the the idea is you have an amount that you can spend until the trust built up the only thing i would say is don't have different amounts for different clients so you need to decide what the amount is and that has to be in your contract and you can't deviate away from it because if you've got one landlord no, that's 50 quid another that's 250 as you scale this gets very difficult to police especially with your operational staff who might not know that that landlord's 50 quid that landlord's 250 quid and then they can end up spending 250 quid on the 50 quid landlord and it can just end up in more hassle than it's worth so you've got to try and keep things simple have one amount in your contract and just run with that and they have to conform to that and understand but if you explain why you're doing it then most landlords are you know no, no problem at all with it and the final note on the management contracts is the information that you supply you need to make it very clear from the start what information the landlords are going to get when they're going to get it i.e the 17th of the month or the 16th they'll get a statement 17th they'll get a payout and then that is it you can then say if you would like more information then it's chargeable and i've got no problem doing this because if you don't set your boundaries you will get inundated with emails and questions for small little things that are not really urgent and they will take up time from your team you'll end up needing more staff so your operation becomes less efficient and more costly if you do not control your boundaries with your owners now the information that they need is typically statements payouts and the contract terms over and above that if they want VAT invoices detailed booking statements that aren't on the system if their accountants need certain information you need to charge for that time because that's going to take your team time away from what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to run the properties and manage the properties and ultimately you know it's going to reduce your efficiency so you really have to have these boundaries and this might sound crazy to be wanting to charge people for additional administration stuff but it is necessary trust me i've been through the headaches and once you put these in play what happens is the noise reduces they stop asking for this information because they don't really need it they just think they need it so if it's freely available they'll ask for it if they know they got to pay for it they'll really question do i actually need this chances are the answer is no and therefore they don't test the ot okay so next up is the guest contract which is crucial for the operation of your business and making sure that you protect your properties your landlord's properties that you're working on behalf of and 
It's really um, a minefield of information that you can put in here, but this is kind of a game what I've worked through over the years, and most of it is scare tactics. So I'm going to talk you through my contract here, and I'm just going to highlight some of the points that I think are absolutely necessary to have in. The standard stuff, your booking information, um, you know, your names, all that sort of stuff is, is just the standard stuff. But for bookings made within 14 days of arrival, full payment by clear funds is required at the time of booking and in the event and cancellation within this period, no refund will be given. That's my cancellation policy for direct bookings. That is how I'm gonna stand. Guess quite clear, it's within the first few lines of the contract. Now, these next few things are how you kind of protect your properties. Occupancy. I don't list properties based on the number of people that are staying in them. I just have a set price. However, what we don't want is that abuse. We don't wanna be saying it sleeps five and 10 people be turning up. Now. What you can do in your contract is put something like this, whereby you know we reserve the right to charge for additional guests at the rate of £100 per guest per night. It's going to be hard to monitor this, don't get me wrong, unless you've got cameras up and you're tracking how many people are staying overnight, which just becomes very laborious. Um, but at the same time, this is not really um, about charging guests this is more about actually putting them off doing it there'll be a percentage that don't even read the contracts they're not bothered and they're going to do what they're going to do and that's the same with damages and criminal activity and things like that you've just got to accept that but if you can deter 20 30 percent of guests from maybe adding extra guests where they would have had they not then you're going to reduce the problems in your properties in addition, guests have a responsibility and duty of care to ensure damage is not deliberately inflicted on the property. Smoking is prohibited and any, any evidence of this in the property it will incur a £2,000 penalty. Now, that might sound a lot, and it is, but the idea here is, is to scare that 20-30% from doing it. If it's £100 or £200, they might think, I'm not that bothered. If it's 2000 they have no idea how you're tracking it or what might happen then it might just deter enough people off to stop them doing it and as we know people smoking in properties is damaging it causes problems for the next guest that comes in so you really want to clamp down on it as much as you can checkout is at 10 a.m on the day of the departure please note you'll be charged 250 pounds for checking out late again any late checkouts cause a knock-on effect to our cleaning team, which can cause disruption with new guests coming in, bad reviews, the whole knock-on effect can be terrible for your business. So it's important that you get that laid out. And again, another threat of higher amount of, you know, two, no one really wants to pay in 250 pound. If you're renting a 10 or 15 grand a week villa, with a full experience, that could be two and a half grand. It's all relevant to the type of properties that obviously you're hosting. Cleaning, they expect to be left in a reasonable state. If it's really bad states, then obviously we reserve the right to charge you for that. Again, it's just another um, another, another sort of deterrent. Uh, smoking, again, I've gone into more detail with smoking for, obviously this is the UK contract, so you know, again, two grand. Keys, another thing that goes missing, um, and access cards, parking cards, they get left in pockets, they get left in cars. It's not that people um, maliciously take these, it's more that they just forget so again you want a bit of a penalty in there and one quick tip with the uh, parking passes and access cards and i've learned this over the years and it you might come across as a bit strange but it really works so with parking passes what you want to do is put it in an a4 frame and put it in the pass because they then need to put that frame in their car now they're not going to drive off with a frame on the dashboard whereas with a little parking pass they can quite easily forget and drive off with that because it's not a nuisance to them since doing that we have had very limited parking passes go missing and similarly with access cards for buildings if you put it on a lanyard in a big sort of plastic holder that they can't take out then again it's chunky they're not going to leave it in their pocket they're going to probably remember to get it out their bag or they'll see it more than just an access card which is like a credit card just lying around so just a quick tip there on how you can limit them because everyone costs you money right i know access cards out here can be 300 350 dirhams which is about 80 pound it gets expensive when they start to get missing lost keys you're looking at uh, locksmiths anywhere from 100 to 200 pounds depending on your location plus then you've got the knock-on effect to the next guest which is the main problem that all of these things cause pets absolute no-no for me uh, again we've got a big penalty in there for pets reason being smells hairs all over the place it just again has a massive knock-on effect to the next guest uh, charges we i put this in here eight percent per day uh, if they if we invoice them based on the terms that they've broken and they don't pay then we charge interest again that is to um, motivate them to want to get this settled off and make sure that they're not just racking up interest uh, when we send the invoice out 
Uh, charges incurred due to the, the damage of the property will be as follows and the lead guest and that is important right the lead guest accepts full responsibility quite often whenever a property gets damaged you get the lead guest saying oh i wasn't there i left the night before all the usual bullshit if you want to really get the money back then you need to make sure you're targeting one individual they've agreed and accepted it and they because they're on the booking they'll get these terms they'll then sign these terms just a side note, these terms are not just for my direct bookings. These are also for my OTA bookings. It all runs through my channel manager uplisting, which obviously I'm going to come on to shortly. And it just automatically gets e-signed and then you've got those contracts. They cannot check in without signing this contract as well. So you know if they're checked in, they've agreed to your terms and therefore you're covered, let's say 80%. You're not always going to get the money back from people even with terms like this, but it does help get money back from the majority um, we've had instances where we've had you know four and a half five and a half grand's worth of damage and properties from parties and we have got that money back we've chased the lead guests we've shown them the contract they've committed to we're showing them they're now getting charged eight percent a day because they're over the seven days of payment and then we've started money claims in the in the small claims courts in the uk uh, for example and that then really tends to trigger them to to, to give us the money back cost of damages to be repaired in full 20 percent admin admin administration charge to organize the repairs you know at the end of the day it's going to take your time your team or yourself time to actually get these repairs call maintenance guys potentially go and pick up parts tools organize things it should be charging i call this hassle tax and you know it should be probably more than 20 percent but it is um you know, 20% things fair. Uh, up to five nights of the rental amount in the event that we are unable to rent the property out to a future guest due to the damage caused. And this does happen. My four and a half grand example, that had to be shut down for a week. We charged them every single night that we were closed at the average rate of that property. Uh, relocation cost of any guests due to you, the problems they've caused. And again, you know, we've done that. These are really important to put in your contract and make sure that you are covering yourself off. If you do not, then you are wide open and you will get hit. You cannot rely on Airbnb's policies or booking.com who don't really have any. Uh, you've got to set your own and you need to make sure that every guest is signing them so that your back pocket is covered. Because if not, especially if you're operating on low margins, which again, I strongly advise that you don't, but a lot of operators do. They work on these smaller properties with low margins. All it takes is one bad guest who doesn't pay and you can't get the money back and your annual profit is gone. So we've gone through the nitty gritty of all the contract stuff. Uh, now we're going to get into the listing of your property, optimizing it, pricing it right, and basically how we make the money out of these things. First one I'm going to start with is Airbnb. Probably the most popular and obviously where the majority of you will get your bookings from at the beginning before you build your direct booking game, which again, we're going to come on to that later in the video. So what we do is typically just go to Airbnb, set up an account, it's very easy to get started. And then you will start to list your property. So you create new listing and it is very easy to create a listing on Airbnb. It's just step by step. So, you know, tell us about your place, make it stand out, finish and publish. Click get started. We go to step by step guide. So step one, tell us about your place and we get house, bed, breakfast, boat cabin. So, you know, we can decide what that is. So we've got house, we click next. Are we renting out an entire place, a room, a shared room? We just go to an, an entire place. We then, where's, where's your place located? Uh, let's just go uh, Bay Central um, Dubai. Here we go. So confirm your address. So you put it in here, show your specific location to guests. I would always click yes. A lot of guests now search on the map feature. So you want to show them your specific location if you can. Is the pin right? Next. You can see here it's very much step by step. How many guests? Four. We've got one bedroom. We've got one bed. We've got one bathroom. So obviously there's going to be a sofa bed in there. Make your place stand out. Again, click next. Click all the amenities that it's got, you know, go through these. Really important that you get as many of the amenities that you do have in, as well as the safety items. And then obviously click next. Then we're going on the photos. Now, photos are super, super important. You not only want to photograph your place, you also want to photograph the experience. People typically aren't just renting Airbnbs for 
the place. In fact, most of them are not renting it for the place. They're using it as a base to stay in for an experience. Whether it's contractors traveling in the UK, whether it's people flying to Dubai for a holiday, they are using your place as a base to then have an experience. It could be a work experience, it could be a holiday experience. But what they need to know is what's in the property, what is around the property, what amenities are around the property, especially in your tourism destinations, pools, beaches, access to shops. You need to make sure that your photographs sell that experience. If you've got Nespresso coffee machines in your properties, you wanna show them that they can have a nice coffee, that you supply Starbucks capsules, whatever it might be, sell the experience. Don't just be a property photographer, for example, who's taking pictures of rooms with furniture in. That's not what you want to do. 50% of your photos should be about the experience, 50% should be about the property and its amenities. Now, let's give you a house of title. This is where I want to show you how important SEO is with Airbnb and a lot of the other booking channels, but also Airbnb, I think it's really important to get your SEO game right. So how the algorithms work on Airbnb, it's very keyword led. And what I mean by a keyword is if you think about when you go to find something out on Google, you'll have either a transactional or an educational type keyword. So you might go how to uh, work a camera, for example, or how to um, find a certain thing on an iPhone. You will type that into Google. Now the keywords are how to, and then say, charge my iPhone. Okay, so charge my iPhone is again keyword. And the, the longer the tail is, the longer the keyword is. And each one is a keyword. Airbnb and the booking channels work very similar. So you've got to think about what is your guest potentially going to type into Google to find your property. Now, they might also just go to Airbnb and type in luxury cabin Vancouver. They might type in a terraced house um, Newcastle. But they also might type it into Google as a starting point because they might not be Airbnb loyal. They might just want to find accommodation. So they want to just search the internet. They want to look at booking.com, TripAdvisor, Google, and everything in between. You want to make sure that your property is ranking as, an, as a search engine optimization. And if you have your search engine optimization on all your booking channels, then when someone types it into Google, Google will be reading, say, Airbnb's website. And if your property ticks those keyword boxes, it will bring it up as one of the listings. Then they might click through to Airbnb and then they might book. This is also why you wanna get your direct booking game in play and get your own website, because ideally you want them to be clicking on your website and coming through. But we just wanna be given the, the guest um, as many options as possible to book our property so we can get the commission. A good thing to work on here, if you go to Google, and let's just say, for example, you have a, a luxury cabin in Vancouver, right? So if we type in luxury cabin Vancouver, now you can see here, Google already recommends keywords or the most common um, typed title so luxury cabins vancouver island luxury cabins vancouver luxury brands in vancouver so this is the the top five or six that they type in now th this blew my mind when i did but if you if you type in underscore afterwards it actually hasn't done much here it's actually taken one away but it would normally put in more options again if you put it in the beginning you'll see it's taking away more options now let's just go for contractor accommodation now, i'm not going to put anything in here i'm just going to put space and then an underscore and then that gives you all of the different options after serviced accommodation that are regular so contract accommodation uk contractor accommodation services barrow and furnace liverpool rust and so these are the most popular um, searches when you put in contractor accommodation after these ones now again you can put it in at the beginning so underscore space and that tells you what you have in terms of a keyword. If we go um, serviced apartments, again, you see there, obviously I'm currently in Dubai, so that's why probably Dubai and Abu Dhabi are coming up, because it's known that I'm in this country and therefore searching. Uh, London, Dubai Marina, if we then go again, search and underscore, it shows you they're probably the most searched in the world. So what you can try and do Again, they're Boulevard, Boulevard Service Departments, Park View Service Departments, Royal Pearl Service Department and Suites. So they're one of the key um, 
tags, for example, or keywords. So what we might do is Boulevard Service Departments is coming up quite hot there, okay? We don't own Boulevard Service Departments, but let's say, for example, we have a service department that's in the Boulevard uh, in business in downtown Dubai, then we would want to make sure that we're incorporating those three words quite regularly in our title and also in our property description. Because then when someone types in, uh, which is here, one of the, the most, or oh, see their Parkview service department. So we might put that we have a Parkview service department in Dubai or in the UK or whatever it might be. Then again, you're getting those words into your title and into your description. And then you're giving yourself the best chance of ranking on Google and also on sites like Airbnb. Because typically what people are going to be typing into Google here is what they're more than likely going to type into Airbnb, booking.com, etc. Use Google as your keyword analysis before you then go into your, your title and your description with Airbnb. And that can make a huge difference to the success of your listing, getting bookings and, and obviously making profit. You know, that's what we're doing this for at the end of the day. That's how you set up your Airbnb listing. Obviously, there's a few more steps to this, but I'm not going to run through them because they're fairly straightforward. You just put in your title, put in your description, um, and then obviously you set it live. Now, with a channel manager like Uplisting, which is the one that I highly recommend, I've used it for years now, and it does everything. You would start your, your journey on Airbnb, you list it there, and then you drag down all the information to Uplisting, and then it connects it to all of the other booking channels. With Airbnb, I don't bother with any of the customizations in terms of the nightly rates or the uh, minimum length stays or anything like that on Airbnb, because I use Price Labs for that, and again, I'm going to come on to that. And everything I'm talking about here, I would encourage you to do from day one because it's important to get into good habits and make sure that you are using these tools that will massively benefit your income. For me, Airbnb for us is just create your account, get your property listed, get your nice photographs on, get your good title and your description in there and then we're going to link them to uplisting and pull the data down and then what we'll then do is we'll set them up on booking.com and Verbo by pushing them from, from, from uplisting. I would encourage you to embrace Airbnb as a channel. Whilst I don't like them, I don't like their air cover policy. I don't like the way that it can just take money out of your bank account. It is a great place for you to start. Uh, they advertise your property for free. They're one of the biggest booking channels in the world. You will get bookings from them if you understand how to play their algorithms. Booking.com is a very specific platform, I think, depending on your location. In the UK, we actually take Booking.com bookings more so than Airbnb. Uh, in Dubai, it's definitely more Airbnb than Booking.com. But you want to be advertised on as many platforms as you can. I know in America, Verbo is huge compared to booking.com. It depends on where you're coming from, where you're operating as to what channels you want, but try and just get yourself in as many places as possible. However, what you don't want to do is spend hours listing on channels that are not going to get you any results. TripAdvisor, we get very little through and some of the like Agoda and, and other channels that we have advertised on in the past, the amount of time it takes to set the listings up, it's just not worth it. Now, your main ones are typically Airbnb, booking.com and Verbo. And uh, you want one side note on channel managers as well. You want to be careful about channel managers that say you list on 40 odd channels and you then get in there, but really you still have to list. It's not just like you press a button and they go to all the channels because there's different feeds, uh, API feeds, XML feeds. Um, you don't necessarily need to get yourself bogged down in the technicalities, but not all channels will just automatically feed from your channel listing by pressing a button. You know, even booking.com here, you have to come in, you've got to come and set your your, your, your property up and then you kind of sync it back through. There's quite a lot of manual integration. But what I want to talk about today on this booking.com is uh, a bit like Airbnb, you just go through uh, setting a property up and going through it. But then you have your, your quality rating or your property page score. It's quite clever. It tells you a lot about what you need to do to improve your property. And you can go through and uh, you see highlights, you've got your property page score, other actions, um, other amenities lists. You want to try and get as many uh, things as you can into your property and then you've got your uh, photographs again like Airbnb we talked about that you want to get as many uh, good photographs about the experience but in terms of the boosting performance your opportunity center uh, will always give you ideas of what you can do to, to boost your, your properties 
I don't necessarily always do them all. I think there's some that you need to, to be careful of and there's some that say my channel manager or my pricing software will do. And also here I add kitchen photos to attract more guests that I know we've got a photo a kitchen in here. Not everything is in here, but you can have a look through and it will tell you certain things that might just help your property even if it's one or two percent over time that can really make a difference so use this as a guide one thing that i do want to look at is the genius partner program and the commission free bookings uh, and also your preferred partner program the genius partner program gives anybody that's a guest who's on the program uh, they get to book your property and they get discount now it will give more visibility to genius partners because naturally they want to push the properties of the people that are going to pay more um, or push the properties that are going to get more bookings. Because remember, I've talked about Airbnb and booking.com before and how they play off against each other. They only have one guest. One guest is only going to book one property. Which platform they book on depends on which platform entices them in the most, gives them the better terms, more than likely the better price and the easiest way to book. So they're fighting against each other. So they're trying to use us hosts to earn them commission but they need to try and entice the guests to book on their platform so they do it in many ways obviously airbnb do it with their cover booking.com tend to do it with the genius programs or the partner programs you can join these programs and but you will tend to give away more money if you do do them it is a case of testing it and seeing if joining them gets you let's say for example if you're giving 10% of your income away you want to be making sure that you're going to be generating more than that in bookings over and above just doing on his standard one thing that i do think is worth doing is the visibility booster and especially when you've got a new property listed you want to give it the best chance of getting booked straight out the gate now what you can do with your visibility booster is you can set certain dates that you want to have say we'll go here the, the, the 6th of 13 where do you want to attract guests from global country what do you want to do so the standard commission that booking.com charge you is 15 percent per booking now if I increase this to 18% and I apply the new commission rate, then I'm not going to do it on this property because this property has been done for quite a while with us. So I don't need to get it further up the algorithms. I will sometimes do it if we're a bit slow on bookings on certain properties. But as this property falls into my UK portfolio, we probably only take about 11% of bookings through booking.com. Now we have a very strong direct booking game around 75%. So I don't necessarily need to be um, using these tools on those type of properties. Again, it's not a one size fits all. But for starting out, you want to try and get the algorithms going. You want to try and get your property up and visible as much as you can. So you're getting bookings. And then once it becomes a popular property, it will stay up there, even if you then reduce this back down to 15%. You could then set that at 18%. And I think every single listing that you put on from day one, you should set at 18%. And then after 30 days, review the performance. If you feel like it needs another booster, just simply come in and put some more dates on and boost it again. In terms of the customizations of booking.com for nightly rates and things like that again i'm going to strongly advise that you do not do it direct on the platform you do it on a pricing tool i use price labs i'm going to show you soon how it works but for me you will make more money for the amount that it might cost you to run per property per month by using these tools from money that you will leave on the table if you were to manage them just solely on here with their pricing tools because these are not dynamic pricing you have to set a rate you'll have a flat rate typically and even airbnb they have um can't remember what they even call it now because i've never used it smart pricing i think it might be since day one they're just not anywhere near as good as these pricing tools so for the cost of 10 pound a listing or whatever it is it's definitely worthwhile investing in the pricing tool but in the main as i said uh, booking.com airbnb they all have a very simple step-by-step -step guide and then you will then connect them back to your channel manager go to a connectivity provider and then you just connect that back to your channel manager on Uplisting, there are many guides and tutorials as well as their help uh, support center to be able to troubleshoot if, you, if, if it's not working as per the guidelines. But they're all pretty straightforward. You don't need to be too tech savvy to be able to list the properties. In the property details, just make sure you're filling out, you know, your, your photos and your policies. Again, um, a bit like... Uh, your contract that you've got for your, your terms of stay. You want to try and max these. So your cancellation policies, you've got your flexible 14 days on here. You've got your non-refundables. I'm going to take it by credit card. 
and gonna have all your, your other policies, your child policies, extra beds. Make sure you detail what your policies are for each property on each platform because they are slightly different depending on the platform that you're operating on. And if you were to put all this on your channel manager, it doesn't necessarily always come through depending on the feeds, especially things like this, check in, check out times. You wanna make sure that they're reflected in your contracts that the guests will sign and also on the booking policy. You don't want one time on the booking policy and another time on the contract because that'll only cause problems further down the line. Same for your damage deposits. What is the amount? How much are you charging them? Make sure again that that's reflected in your uh, policies and on your contracts but in the main that's all you need to do on booking.com and then the rest of it really is taken care of by the pricing tools and the pricing software because that's where you're going to drive your bookings from you, you, your setup here is really just your front end make sure the pictures are right make sure your advert looks right make sure that your titles and your descriptions it's all in this tab here just make sure it's all filled out that you've got the right name um, booking.com doesn't work as seo uh, friendly as say airbnb you can't write a description you're just basically putting in all your amenities and then it will form a description for you just based on the amenities can't put near a park and there's a coffee shop down the road called xyz it is just simply a title but even with your property name you want to try and make it you know seo friendly if you can and then just fill in all of the other bits and bobs with regards to the property section and then get that property connected to your channel manager and get it set live. So in terms of optimizing for success, I think there's a few things that we need to cover off. And the first one is minimum night stay. Now I made the cardinal sin of having one night minimum when I first started the business and I was getting bookings. But what I didn't realize is the turnover costs were huge at the end of the month, the stress, the hassle, the headache, and also the opportunity cost of not having dates available. So for example, if someone books a Wednesday night on a one night booking, then that can potentially prevent someone booking Monday to Friday, which is typically what we get now in terms of bookings now that I've tweaked things. In the UK, I have a three night minimum through the week and a two night on a weekend. I have certain properties that I've got five night minimums on, eight night minimums on. And again, it's not one rule and one size fits all. You have to have a look at your data, but you need to start somewhere. So if I was starting somewhere where I would probably go three nights through the week, two nights at a weekend. You could possibly do two and two, but in the main, that works for most properties that I've experienced in many locations. But then what you want to do is have a look at your data on each property. Using a tool like Price Labs, it's gonna give you the information of how many nights stay on average is your property getting booked for, how many days before the booking's coming in, so what's the lead time before guest stays from when they made the booking. And all this type of information allows you to just constantly be tweaking each and every property to maximize the ability. For example, if your average length stay is eight nights, why have a two night minimum? All you're gonna do there is potentially put in a two night minimum that's gonna block an eight night booking. Now obviously an eight night booking is more profitable for you because you're only gonna clean once in that eight nights. Whereas if you had two nights over eight, that's four cleans. So ultimately your costs are going up. So by utilizing the data and the analytics that you get told, you wanna to then refine your minimum night stays for your properties. Now, don't get me wrong, you might be operating a hotel in a location that will only attract one night stays, then you gotta go one night, that's part of the parcel, but then you need to make sure that your nightly rate is at a price that's gonna cover the cost of the turnover and all of your staff costs to run increasing volume of traffic coming through your properties. So minimum nights, start three nights two nights would be my advice and then look at your data and tweak so every 30 days you want to be looking at your data is it changing is it seasonal in certain months you might have certain uh, averages versus obviously other months peak seasons high seasons that sort of thing so obviously in say in the uk in july and august if we have availability then our minimum nights actually drop because most people are holidaying so they might want you know only two days or three days versus say in the average months of the year where we're attracting more contractors through the door then those average nightly stays push out to 26 27 days you want to make sure that you've got unlimited availability and what i mean by that is many of the booking channels will only allow your calendars for the first three months out so to, from today three months out we can be booked but after that it's closed so sometimes when you're doing area analysis you might see on airbnb or booking.com 
that they're fully booked sort of three months out. And you might think, oh, they've got a really good bookings coming in. But no, that's just that they've only got their calendars open for three months. The booking channels don't actually like this. They prefer you to have 100% availability at all times. And sometimes you just need to make some tweaks and make sure that you're opening your calendars for foreseeable and that they're not restricted. The reason you do that is when you're pricing, again, using price tabs, you'll set a, a rule called far out pricing, which are, again, I'll come on to in a second. But what you're going to do is say, if anything is booked over a certain amount of days, then I want to charge a 200% price increase because it doesn't really matter. If you know that your average lead time is 11 days, then if someone's booking 365 days in the future, it doesn't matter what the price is. So you might as well maximize that. That means that they are very keen on booking those dates and they are probably not price sensitive they're going to book the property that they need for those dates it could be a concert it could be a football match it could be need to go to a, a family important birthday or something like that there's a reason they need to book that far in advance that price isn't really the factor so then you can maximize the revenue for that time because you know that on average 11 days up to that date is when you're typically going to get the booking so if, you, if you're booked 20 days before that date it doesn't matter and that's what that's where your data and your analysis comes in and it's really important to use your your tools like price lab one thing that i think is is really important is your cancellation policy many people have many different ideas on this for me i have a 14 day cancellation policy it kind of fits with that average length of stay or average lead time sorry of 11 days what i want to do is minimize my loss so if someone decides to cancel two weeks weeks before the the stay date then based on my 11 day average lead time i am still potentially going to get a booking to be able to fill in the void that they've left by canceling almost last minute if you have a one day three day five day cancellation policy then it's going to make it very difficult if your average lead time is 11 days to be able to then fill that property if they cancel three or four days out because your average lead time is telling you that most people that stay with you book 11 days before the stay date. If you've only got two days left before those dates come up, then you're probably gonna go empty. And again, that's gonna affect your profitability. Okay, so let's dive into Price Labs because I think this is one of the most important tools. And there are some other ones. Price Labs is the only one I've used since day one. I have had trials on, on some of the other ones, but um, I think once you get comfortable with one and it's working, just stick with it. What you have on Price Labs is there's various sections, your analytics, your market dashboard. But for me, the, the, the customizations is where really I want to, to cover off today because this is what's gonna make a difference to your property's success and making sure that you're not leaving any money on the table. And that's the main thing with these, these sort of pricing softwares. You kind of have accounts, group listings, uh, and minimum stay profiles, but your account is, if you make changes on your account level, it will change every property within the account. If you make changes on your group level, it will make changes to the properties that you've assigned into those groups. And if you make changes to your listing level, then that will make changes to the specific listing, so the, the exact property. Now, depending on how you operate, uh, you you might may decide whether you want to do groups or accounts, but each listing needs its own pricing structure. We go into the edit section of each listing, and you'll see here that a lot of mine are, are turned off because I, I run them mainly on a group level, but you can pop them on and then it gives you options to fill out. And what you then wanna do is, you know, what's your default, default minimum stay rule? We've just discussed that. You might do three days through the week, two days on the weekend. You then have orphan gaps. If you, you wanna know what things are, you, th th there are, you know, information bars and also there's tutorials, but orphan gaps is basically, if say for example, you have a two night minimum stay and someone books Monday, Tuesday, and someone also books Thursday, Friday, then you've got what's called an orphan day, which would be the Wednesday. Now your rule is that you need a two night minimum stay. So that night can then not be booked. However, with the pricing tool, what you can do here is you can say, okay, well, if I've got a gap of one night on a weekday, and uh, you might go between nights one and one, then you can then take a booking on that orphan gap. And the same with last minute bookings. You might decide that you will accept last minute bookings. And again, within certain night timeframes. And then obviously we have our far out bookings as well. We can decide whether we're gonna take the far out bookings as well. Now, 
what we then do is we go customize last minute prices so you might say i want a uh, flat increase of 50 percent uh, premium within one day so if someone does book last minute you might want to charge them more uh, same with orphan days if um, let's say for example um, you want a percentage on a weekday you want a hundred percent increase uh, weekends you want a hundred percent increase on a premium for gaps between you know one and one so uh, you can only have 80% maximum. What you're basically saying there is you're going to get a two night minimum stay price for a one night stay. So that Wednesday where typically you wouldn't want to do a one night stay, it actually makes it viable to do it because you're more than likely, you're going to cover your cleaning costs. It's going to be a quick turnover. Yeah, a bit more hassle and a bit more, you know, guest management to do, but for an 80% increase on the rate, it's probably worth doing. And that's, that's the only reason that I would ever do one night bookings if I'm going to get 180% of the rate, for example. Again, your far out pricing. Again, set how, how do you want to how do you want to work? Do you just want a flat fee, or do you want to have a gradual increase? Depending on how many days, you might increase the price one uh, percent over hundred days, and then obviously it increases or decreases. Um, occupancy based adjustments. This is something that you tweak with. I would always just start with the standards that they offer. They have several different types. So they have aggressive far premium, step last minute, super aggressive discount, and custom. When you start getting data with your properties, you will then start customizing each and every one. This is kind of the default. Now, the default is you would assume based on lots of data that they've got that they know works, but you might say you want to go a bit more aggressive, not to 15 days. You know that, say for example, for me, the average lead time on some of my UK properties is 11 days. I know if I, if I want to change that to not to 10 days, I might need to go a bit more aggressive depending on the occupancy of the property. So if I've got say less than 70% occupancy on this property, then I might want to start discounting a bit heavier at the beginning because I know that I've probably missed the boat for getting the booking because my average lead time's 11 days. We're now 10 days before the stay is about to happen. So I now need to do something to try and entice any of those last minute bookers, um, which is the smaller portion of the people booking based on my data to book. So I might go a bit more aggressive. I might then say from 11 to 20 days, which I know is probably where the, the average booking period is. I don't maybe need to go as aggressive because I know people book within that day. I'm gonna say from 21 days to whatever, 365 days. I, I, I don't even want a discount because I'm not bothered if people book because I, I know I'm gonna get bookings around this period here. So I don't need to panic around getting booked on these dates. There's different ways you can do it. Can, as I said earlier, just, just choose one of their profiles. So you could just go super aggressive discounting and you can see there it's banged in, you know, 35, 25s, 20s. If you're 10% occupied on your portfolio, 20%. Again, if you're 80% and you decide that, do you know what, if I'm 80%, I'm making good profit. For anybody that wants to book, if I'm 80% full, I actually want to add a 10% premium on that. And in this period, I want to add a 5% premium. Or you might even go further. You might want a 30%. And on this one, you might want 100% because you're not bothered. You, your average bookings are coming here and you're also full. So it will then tweak based on how occupied your property is and how, how, how many days are left before the actual stay date. And this is where I think you really get the benefit out of this system is by setting your, your discounting structure uh, and your premium structure so that the prices are constantly changing on a day-to-day -day basis based on how your individual property or group of properties, if you're gonna go on a group stage, are performing. Side note on that, if you are gonna do grouping, then, and you're gonna customize based on grouping, then it will go on the occupancy of the group. And I don't necessarily think that's a good thing to do uh, in the main, because I think each property on its own merit for the traditional sort of serviced accommodation type models work as individual businesses in themselves. If you have a hotel with multiple rooms or maybe a you know load of lodges uh, in a certain location on a bit of land, might be a bit different but i think for the main for the majority of you know what i teach and what i've experienced um each one kind of needs its, its own its own customization you can then do seasonal profiles if you are in certain areas where it's very seasonal then you might say you want to do uh, between let's just say um dubai winter uh, start date is pretty much now uh, november 1st till probably end of april 
and you might want to say I want a minimum price of X or I want a minimum stay profile and create a profile saying well actually in that season I know I get longer bookings or I don't need to panic so much so I can increase my prices or I can dictate that I want a five night minimum you can set it all up and it's all about just testing 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 and reading the data reading the analytics once you've got your bookings once you're starting to see traffic through and you will then start to play around with these customizations and then over time you'll actually come up with customizations that just work and you don't really need to then do much more with them i regularly dive into here and just have a look at the data and i'll tweak but the amount of tweaks that i make last couple of years have been minimal compared to say the first few years of operation when i was still trying to get the grips with how data works how properties perform how customizations affect things one thing that i do tend to do on a monday morning is i'll look at what's not been booked that week go into uh in the customizations got the account level and got the account calendar and then i can say okay well i want to set a a discount uh for the next four days because i know that typically so i just go add here and i'll go from 6 november to the uh let's just open this up for here to thursday i know that especially in the uk for example so i'd probably do this on, on my group uk account i'd go okay well i know that we should be booked now and any properties that aren't booked i need to drive some traffic into so whilst i've got my presets on and things are going to happen anyway in terms of the discount i might say i really just want to force some bookings here so i might go minus 20 percent for anybody that books between monday and thursday and i'll set that on a monday morning and then any contractors for example that are going to be traveling just for the week this week there's a good chance that my property is going to pop up Am I at a loss? Yes, I'm probably giving more money away, but based on my data, I'm probably not going to get booked because I've already missed that booking window of 11 days. So I do need to try and just drive something. So I would set that and then I just add it and then it goes on the calendar here and that will then give a further 20% on all of top of all the other customizations to be then drive those bookings through. For me, great, great tool, Price Labs, and something that really you need to spend a lot of time analyzing the data tweaking around with things seeing how things affect in terms of if i do give a discount am i getting bookings if i am are the bookings outweighing the discount and it's just playing with these sort of things and analyzing your data and if you do that on a regular basis you will make some great customizations you'll understand the platform and how your properties are reacting to the platforms and it will really help your profitability in the long run one thing that I did do at the beginning, it gets a bit harder as you've got a bigger portfolio and it's also probably not as necessary because you get used to reading the data, but I had a, a Google spreadsheet and I just put each property and then every Wednesday I went and made a change of five or 10 pounds up or down. What I would do is I would have, say for example, if the nightly rate was 100, I'd started at 100. And then what I would do is I would then go and change it. So if I wasn't booked, I would then change it to 90 and I'd color it in red to show that I'd actually gone down in price. And then I would then see what the bookings were like for the next week. And if they were good, I might then choose 90 again. And I would put that in white because then I haven't changed the price. And I would then see if, if, if that was the same pattern, if I'm still getting booked. If I was still getting booked, I might then increase it to 95 and I would put that in green to show that I've increased. And then if I was then continued to get bookings, I would then go again back to, to 100 and I'd go back to green. But then if 100 then meant I'd stop getting bookings, I'd come back down to 95. And again, I just color coordinated with, with all the different uh, properties that I had. And I probably did this for the first 20 or 30 properties because it was manageable to be able to do it without uh, on a spreadsheet and do it manually. As you get a bigger portfolio, it becomes more difficult and you need to use something like Price Lab. But the idea was is I started to see patterns of when I had properties at certain prices, they got booked. And the minute I creep them out by literally five pounds, it would then stop getting bookings. So you kind of found your own base rate. There is a base rate helper on Price Labs. When you list a property on there, you go to base rate helper, it will say, as per your market, this type of property, it should be priced at this. That is a good guide and I do recommend using it. I think the data is quite accurate, but you wanna try and also just figure out your own base rate for each property and see what it is. And then you can play around with that number as per the property's success or if it's not working. And for me, that was, a real good guide to 
understanding my prices, being involved in what was going on. So I think too many people think that you can just set and forget these businesses. It's not a case of listening to channel managers, putting it on Airbnb or even putting it on price labs and just saying, okay, I'm done now. I'll just let the bookings roll in. You have to be working on it all the time because if you're not, there's people like me that are and they will end up further ahead than you. They'll be getting the bookings. You won't be getting the bookings. And it is a simple... 20 minutes, one hour every week just to deep dive into your portfolio and have a look at what's working, what's not, and make some tweaks. It's very much like marketing and just split testing. All the time you're just seeing what's working. You know, if you've got a good advert, can you improve it? Has the result been better or worse? If it's better, you go again. If it's worse, you maybe revert back to the original and try and change that. No different with what we're doing here with Price Labs or with your properties using Price Labs. Okay, so we've got the setup, we've got the booking channels. Now what we really need to do is drive some bookings. Now, AirbnbBooking.com, they're gonna you know, definitely have the biggest impact on your business in the beginning. But there's many other uh, websites that do help drive bookings in different ways. So for the UK, which I'm gonna cover off first, Situ is a contractor. They, these guys actively go out there and try and find contractor work. You can register with them and then they will bring uh, bookings to yourself. Uh, a great way to kind of increase your exposure. Now, the only thing I will say with a lot of these websites is just have a look at what the charges are. And again, coming back to the, uh, have also have a look at whether they are prominent in your area, because if they haven't got loads of properties in your area, there's a good chance that they're not trying to win contracts in your area. So therefore listing with them could be a waste of time. And, Typically what I've found with these type of websites, they're not just plug and plays. You tend to have to gather a lot of data for them. It's not an easy process to get listed. Might be okay if you've got one or two units, but if you've only got one or two units, you know, it might not be as beneficial if you've got a portfolio. But having said that, if you've got a portfolio, it might be quite laborious to get yourself onto the platform. So you just got to kind of weigh it all up. But I do think it's worthwhile speaking to these people, finding out what their terms are, finding out how much traffic they think they can drive to you and kind of just you know, opening the door with them and, and building relationships. So you've got Situ, um, you've got another one, again, find, find a home, um, another website that, you know, helps people, you know, find homes and you can, you know, on a short-term basis as well. Um, we have Comfy Workers. Again, these guys specialize in contractor accommodation in the UK and they, um, you know, they, they have their own website where they can book, but they need your properties to be able to go through. Uh, I know these, um, you know, again, you just want to check how much they charge uh, for your listings. You've got to make sure that's worthwhile in terms of the return that you're going to get because obviously properties like Airbnb booking.com, whilst they charge 15%, 18%, whatever it might be, you're only actually paying for that when you get a guest. Whereas if you're having to pay a subscription to be on some of these websites, you're then taking a risk on your marketing spend because there's no guarantee that you're going to get a booking back. Silver Door um, used to be for everybody now. I know they do have certain limitations on portfolio size. So again, you need to check with them that your portfolio is big enough to be able to go on. And also that it works for their type of guests and also where they are. Uh, Google My Business is one I, I really want to talk about because this can take a while to set up but um, and get verified. And that's one of the biggest things is you want to make sure you get verified. And really what you want to do is be setting up each and every property that you have as its own Google My Business page because you want to give it the maximum exposure. For example, if you've got a property in Gated, Durham, Newcastle, Sunderland, so you've got four different properties there, each one of them is going to have different keywords. So what we'll you see here, when I typed in contractor accommodation Manchester, if we scroll down slightly, these are the Google My Business pages that come up. So, you know, what we want to do is make sure that we're getting into this Google My Business page when we have those keywords searched for us. So if someone was to search, you know, contractor accommodation, Newcastle, my Durham properties are not going to come up in that search. So by just having one Google My Business page, I'm potentially missing out on people that are searching for the locations. So what you want to do is get each location on as its own Google My Business page and then set them up, get them verified so that you know Google gives it the exposure and you will get direct inquiries from this and you will get bookings from it, especially if you link it back to your websites and you've got a good direct booking website that converts, then you will get bookings, but also make sure that your phone's a man, that your emails are manned, and that you're doing everything you can to get your bookings through. So one of the 
I guess, golden uh, websites for me in the UK for direct bookings is, is OpenRent by far. So we use this as a very good tool to um, promote our listings on sites like Rightmove and Zoopla, which are typically only for agencies if you've got agency packages. Now, a lot of contractors, a lot of people looking for stays, they do actually go on to Rightmove and Zoopla looking for longer term accommodation than say the Airbnb websites and booking.com. And really they're the type of people, or certainly they're the type of people that I want in my properties. Having the bigger, the four, five, six bed properties, you want to be trying to find the longer stay bookings that have less turnover costs. They're gonna pay you because they don't necessarily want to go and rent a property that's over six months and furnish it. I know I've talked previously on the deal source and how we use open rent to find deals, However, we can also use OpenRent to find long-term guests. And as well as the Google My Business page, um, OpenRent really is a powerful, powerful tool. What we wanna do is advertise our property on OpenRent. I think this might be one of ours here. Let's have a look. Yes, it is. It's very much short-term accommodation. We're stating that from the out. It, this is all keyword stuff, okay? So when people are typing into Google, there's a potential that this listing can come up. We've got multiple properties available to book in Newcastle, so we're telling people that we've got other options as well. If they don't necessarily think that's a good fit for them, they might still pick the phone up and call us. What we do, what we offer in terms of all bills included, car parking, things like that. Perfect fit for, and then again, these are all kind of keywords. Message landlord or request viewing. We've then got our price you can see here our rent per month we what we call profit price here you want to figure out how much your profit margin is that you would like from this type of property and then that would be what you would charge per month and then when you get into the negotiation side of it you might add extras on like you're cleaning you might add on top or you might say you know say well that's my price if you book it for 12 months if you only want it for one month at a time it might go to 2100 a month so you get to decide the idea here is we just want to get the inquiry you can see here that we're saying we are a holiday let company and uh, our various policies and terms that we've discussed but these type of listings they're crucial to getting longer term bookings and if you do do this then you will i tell you get direct direct bookings it's 29 pound to list for three months it's the best 29 pound you can spend i do find that we get a lot more inquiries for our larger stock than we do the the smaller stock but again if you've listened to anything I've said over the last few hours or any of my other YouTube videos, you'll you'll start to hopefully get the message that I'm really trying to encourage you to stay away from apartments. You really want to start staying away from the smaller stock. We only want to be getting into four, five, and six beds in uh, the UK. It works well. The profit margins are there and the risk is less, even though the setup costs are more and it attracts contractor bookings. The larger houses attract contractor bookings and there's more profit margin in them. Open rent for me is a great tool to maximize your exposure and really get those direct bookings. But again, you've got to set yourself up correctly. You've got to have the right keywords, the right descriptions, and know how these websites play. In Dubai, very similar to the UK, we have Bayut, Debizzle, and Property Finder. You can advertise short terms. It's another avenue for you to get monthly expat bookings, uh, similar to the kind of contractor model in the UK, which then decreases your operational costs, increases your profit. There's many ways that you can increase your exposure and I would advocate doing as much as you can on this front because if you can get a direct booking as well, you, you're controlling the booking a lot more. Same with the agencies, even your silver doors, your comfy workers, people like that. They're gonna have more control over the guest. There's no kind of air cover policy where if a guest finds a fly on the bed, they can get a full refund. They are a bit more on the host side as well as the guest side. That's the type of booking that you wanna be getting through your doors on a regular basis versus your Airbnb and booking.coms. But in the main, you're going to start with Airbnb and booking.com at the beginning. There's no harm in that. That's where you've got to start your business. But as you scale, you want to be getting them onto your direct website or through these type of channels or through your Google My Business page. And you will then start to see your business profitability increase quite, quite considerably. Running these businesses takes a lot of time and effort. And the more properties you get, the more problematic it can become if you do not have everything set up correctly. And what you wanna do is automate as much of this as you possibly can. And this for me is where your channel manager comes into play. For me, I use Uplisting. Uh, there's many other property management systems out there and there's many coming to the market all the time. But for me, this is a tool that I've used uh, for a number of years now. I've tested and tried several others 
and it just works and I would advocate it to anybody. If you do want to get a free trial on it, link in the description of this video. But let's dive into the fundamentals of why I believe you need to use this tool. The starting point for me is all around the automation of it and taking away as much of the hassle as possible. You can connect multiple channels up to this one tool. So if you get a booking from Airbnb, it goes into Uplist and Uplist and then blocks the data off on all of the other booking channels. You're not having to log into booking.com, Verbo, TripAdvisor, and then block those data out manually. Obviously, multiple bookings, that's gonna take a lot of time and hassle if you do not have this automation set up. What it then does is it then also puts a date in your cleaner's calendar, which you can either use the uplisting version or you can use their partner affiliation with Turno. And then it will stay to your cleaner. You have a clean on this date. It will also send them an email notification, not having to ring your cleaner and tell them. Although I would advocate with cleaners that you do check that they have received and they are on top. But as you get to work with your cleaning team, then you get in sync and you know you can just trust them to go out. But the idea is that it then automates everything. So you're not having to then schedule that side of things. Similarly, if a booking gets canceled, it comes out of the cleaner's schedule. It comes out of your schedule and everybody gets notified. You're not having to again, ring around and tell people that there's work or not work. One thing with the automation you can set up guest messaging automating. So similar messages will be sent to a lot of the guests. Now, in terms of the automation sequence here, if we go to the guest messaging section, you can see here, you can set auto responders, enable auto responders, depending on when they inquire. So thank you for reaching out to us. Our team is currently reviewing your inquiry. The reason that you would do this is that the uh, booking channels like hosts that are responsive. So if you have an autoresponder going out, it will tell the guest that, listen, we're, we're, we've got your message and we're coming back to you. Uh, but the main thing is it's gonna tick the algorithm for the booking channel to say, this host is very responsive. They respond within seconds of receiving guest's inquiry. Sometimes you might wanna put a time delay in, one minute, two minutes, whatever it might be. But in the main, that then helps and push your listings further up so we get more views and potentially we then get more bookings. In its entirety, that alone is probably worth the money that it would cost you to use uplisting for each property that you've got or any other property management system. We then have custom message tags and custom property attributes and also reviews. So the custom message tags and the custom property attributes allows you to then be able to send auto response. You can change uh, these are your tags here. So if you want to put in, thank you very much for your inquiry on listing address or for a certain amount of days, you click length of stay. And then for each one, it would specify it based on um, the specific property that they were inquiring on or the time limit that they were inquiring on. You can get very, very specific with what you're doing on this software. Reviews as well. Uh, this, I because I've got a team and I like my team to be uh, checking various things before we write a review which basically creates the business um, to be a bit more efficient due to the the size that I've got but when it was just me I would have this on autopilot because you can actually have several different review templates and it will then just send the reviews out because again if you are reviewing your guests Airbnb like it and then it will boost your algorithm points it will give you more views and then ultimately you'll get more bookings the downside of this and the word of warning is if you have a bad guest and you then typically you're going to write these review templates as positive you then write them a positive review you then need to do an air cover claim because they've damaged your property Airbnb will say well why did you say they were a great guest on the review and it can cause a few issues so that is one word of warning with this auto review scheduling. However, you can do a time delay before submitting a review. As it says here, Airbnb typically allow you to review your guests three to four hours post checkout. You want to try and get in there. So you can review and turn it off, but in the main, I, I prefer not to have this on. Now, in terms of the protection of the property, we've spoke about this a lot with the guest contracts, and this is where, again, this system comes into play. Every time a guest booking comes in, 
we then have is the guest identity uh, check goes out. So they get an, an email saying to complete your booking, you need to follow the following steps and they have to then submit their identification and then it runs through to make sure that we are getting who's on the booking and goes through to collect the security deposit. This is linked to our Stripe account. All you do is link your Stripe account into here and then it will collect security deposit. You can detail how much deposit you want from different properties. If you want to specify different amounts of different properties, that's absolutely fine. You can do all that here so you can customize it per listing or you can just have it one set deposit for the whole portfolio. We then have the e-sign rental agreement, which are kind of the three main things that you need to protect yourself. You'll see here, we've got the rental agreement in here as a customer customized attribute that then will put the rental agreement in here and it will list it out for these different booking channels. And by having these three things in place, we are protecting ourselves. But the great thing about this system is it does it all for us. We're not having to manually chase people. We all we're doing is basically allowing this to go out. And then when the guest is verified, then it will then send them their door codes. That's the next step of the automation. We set rules up to basically say, if the guest hasn't done the contract, they haven't done their ID, um, they haven't paid their deposit, do not send door codes. Send them a reminder email instead to say, you've done your contract and you've done your ID, but you haven't actually done your deposit. So you need to pay us your deposit before we're gonna send you your door codes. Again, this is all stuff just to limit the amount of staff that you need to chase people and make sure that the guest's not gonna turn up without access codes and therefore they're gonna be on the phone to you. It's gonna cause a bad start to the whole experience and ultimately can lead to a bad review. So all we're doing here is trying to limit the damage and make us as efficient as possible. Now, don't get me wrong, and I am one of the world's worst. I don't read emails when I book properties. I tend to just turn up. There are a lot of people like me, and as I say to my team, Team, if we're constantly sending auto emails out and they're still not doing anything, then yes, we're going to need to pick the phone up or we're going to need to WhatsApp them and just say, listen, we've sent you some emails. You need to do this, this, and this before you're going to get your access codes. If you don't do it, we can't let you in the property and can be quite strict with that. And we have actually had guests that have turned up, will refuse to do this, and we will not let them in the properties. In my experience, never, ever, ever let a guest in that will not sign a contract and will not pay a deposit if that's your terms, because it means it's a huge red flag that they, they're, they're up to no good and they're wanting to do something that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, with Uplisten as well, you do actually get a, a website or a, a plugin where you can take direct bookings. So if we take a direct booking, we can then send them a payment link and then that goes to your Stripe account. And again, it then triggers all of the automated emails. So it will do exactly what we just spoke about in terms of the verification and making sure that everything is in tow before the guest stays. And in terms of outbound messaging, you can set up um, as many outbound messages as you want and you can specify each and every message for however many properties that you do want them through. And then you can set all your messages after booking, before arrival, after arrival, before departure, after departure, you can choose the different property IDs and it then gives that specific message for that specific property. So you can really tailor this to your business to make your life so much easier. And if you do do that, then you're gonna have a good business from day one. Um, you're gonna be very efficient and it's gonna mean that you can keep your costs down, which is something I would advocate a lot. You do not want loads of staff in this business if you can help. This software never takes a day off. It doesn't take holidays. It doesn't have sick days. So if you can get it right, then can really enhance your business. Another software that I tie into this is Zapier. If you've not heard of Zapier, it is a great tool. I run early amounts of zaps, probably 25,000 zaps a month. I pay something like 400 pounds for the software, but the amount of man hours that the zaps help me with is insane. I would have to probably have 20, 30 more staff if I didn't, if to do the job that this system is doing. This also links with uplisting. One thing that I do have it do is whenever we get a booking come into uplisting, it then sends a zap to say my Google chat, which is where all my team is to say, we've got this booking and we then also have the same for cancellations. Now, although the software is doing it and we've got the calendars and everything like that, I just like to know and see what bookings are coming through. I like to wake up in the morning and have a scroll through and see what sort of amounts are coming through. It's almost just like a fail safe. Also, if we keep getting lots of cancellations, then I wanna know why and uh, if it's on a specific property. And if also you get a cancellation, that's say the day before, same day, then for me, 
I then look at that as, okay, have we done something wrong or is it just a guest decided not to come and they've forfeited their money? And so I will just quickly ask the ops team, was that our fault or was it a guest? And then if it's our fault, I obviously dig into it. So just as you grow your business, you still need to keep your eyes on your business. And there's many things you can do with Zapier, not just for uplisting, but for automate leads uh, in. You can obviously Facebook leads. A lot of stuff we have zapped onto Google Spreadsheet. So when a booking comes through, it can go to a Google Spreadsheet and then we can maybe import that into our accountancy software. You can have the bookings go straight into your accountancy software. Um, there's so many things that you can do with, with Zapier. It's just an incredible tool that I would encourage you to start playing around with. I know the first time I did it, it absolutely blew my mind, but in essence, you choose a trigger. So what's the software that triggers? There are so many softwares in here and then that, that create the trigger. So when something happens in one software, what do you want it to do in another software? So there's the action. So you've got the trigger and the action and you just map it up very much like listing your Airbnb and your booking.com listings, just step by step, link it all up. It does a test and then it tells you whether it's worked or not. And that for me is really why you need to have a channel manager in and, and use technology, should we say, in these businesses because you can become very efficient and it will save you a hell of a lot of time in the long run. Get into good habits at the start. A lot of people go, oh, I don't want to pay for that yet. I've only got one property. I don't need it. Um, I don't need to pay for a pricing software, an extra 30, 40 pounds a month or whatever. I'm telling you now, you will make the money back tenfold by having it in property portfolio from day one and getting used to setting them up, running it. The worst thing you can do is get 10 properties, have no idea how all this works and then start to play around with it. You, what, you're going to need this. If you want a property portfolio, you're going to need all these softwares. So you might as well do it now. And if you do it now, you're going to be good at it. You're going to be better at it. Each and every property that you list, you're going to get more efficient with. As you play around with the customizations and the automations, you're going to get better with it. Same with Zappy. As you set up more zaps, you're going to get more creative. The more you do of it, the better. So I would advocate getting it done from day one. Okay, so as we come towards the end of the training, I just want to wrap up with a few key things. So first and foremost, with the accountancy side of things, your numbers are the be all and end all of your business. And you must ensure that you know where you're at at all times. Don't be fooled to think Airbnb and booking.com pay you every single penny. They don't. You sometimes do get bookings that aren't paid for and you need to be chasing them through. Now, the way that I do it is I make sure that every single booking we get goes into my zero accountancy software. And then that sits as a overdue invoice. And only when we get the money in from the booking channel, do we then pay that invoice off. By doing this, we can then run an age debt as report at any time. And it will tell us how much each booking channel owes us. And it will also then drill down into which booking we haven't been paid for. That is a absolute must that you need to get in. It's okay when you're only maybe getting three or four bookings a month, but as you get five properties, 10 properties, 100 properties, the game starts to change. And that's when you can start losing big chunks of money if you are not chasing the booking channels for what's rightfully yours. They're not gonna come knocking on your door and say, oh, by the way, we haven't paid you 20 grand. You're gonna have to go and chase that. And they don't have robust accountancy systems. Don't get me wrong, they're pretty good. Like 85, 90% of bookings get paid, but there are the ones that don't. And if you don't chase them, you will never see that money. Really important that you have an accountancy process in place, just like you've got your automation for your, your channel manager and your bookings and your cleaning apps. And just like you've got your deal sourcing process and you know, everything needs to be a system and a process and your accountancy is the be on end. Or you should be able to understand the profit and loss report. You should be able to understand the balance sheet and you should be looking at your accounts on a weekly basis, whether it's just with yourself at first and having almost like a board meeting with yourself and just going through the financials. How many bookings have we had? Are we increasing, decreasing profitability? What are we spending money on? Where can we cut down on costs? These are conversations you should be having with yourself from the start. And as you grow as a team and as you start hiring bookkeepers and then full-time accountants, then these are the conversations that you will have on a weekly basis because your business needs that to be able to know where you're going and you manage it with numbers. There's no better way than to manage your business through your profitability or sometimes your losses. When you're losing money, you need to know, okay, I'm losing money on this property on a regular basis. Should we just hand the notes back? Should we get out the lease? Um, should we sell it? Financial data will drive your business decisions more than any other data that you have. Your price labs, your booking numbers, it's all just metrics, but the profit and loss statement that's in your business and the profit and loss statement for each property that you need to create will 
drive your business forward or it will bury your business overnight when things start going south. Really important that you use the software. For me, Zero is something I started on. I've used QuickBooks, I've used Sage, and I've come back to Zero because I just think it's the most user-friendly software for your accounts. And I would advocate getting, again, a subscription from day one, starting to use it, getting all your costs on there, getting all your bookings on there, create your profit and loss reports, drill down into each properties by creating your categories and you will then really have a good sense of how to run a business from day one and i cannot stress how important it is for the numbers i took on coaching a student she was young and she had a great business so she thought she had about 15 properties she thought she was making about 15 grand a month net profit now because there was a lot of money coming into the business then the cash flow was blinding her from the profitability she wanted to scale which is why she came on my one-to-one -one program and all she wanted to do was deals so how do i get more deals and i said before we do that we need to actually have a look at your financials let me have a look into your accounts she said, well i haven't had everything married up i haven't got all my costs allocated I'm a bit behind on my books. And that for me was one of the biggest alarm bells. So I then said, well, I need you to get you up to speed with your books before we'll go find any more properties because we don't want to go find more properties if they're not profitable. You've got 15 properties, you're gonna have a lot of cash coming through. So you can actually be losing money, but because your bank's constantly getting injections of capital, you think you're making money. And this was the case here. She went from making 15 grand a month in her mind to actually losing five grand a month in reality. And it was because of three properties that were absolutely hemorrhaging cash. She obviously felt like on the face of it, sort of 80, 85% of her portfolio was great. You could see, okay, money's coming in and yes, that's more money than rent's costing me. But until we drilled down onto the exact costs of all the properties and what revenue was coming in, we, we, we didn't know where the money was going. We did find out and obviously we got rid and then the business was then very profitable. And then you then go, okay, well, what's the common pattern between the properties that are profitable and what's the common pattern between the properties that are losing money? Obviously we stay away from them. We double down on them and we get more of them. And again, this is how you scale efficiently and how you scale profitably. I've made the mistake of chasing quantity over quality, but I am very good with analytics and it's something that I've invested time and effort into from day one. When I can see a problem arising, I see it in my accounts first and then I investigate into other data and then I can make strategic decisions from that data. And you need to make sure that you're in a position very similar from day one if you want to be successful in this game. Now, in terms of compliance, there's a couple of things you need in the UK, which is the property redress scheme, the PRS and ICO, the information commissions officer. These are for your property redress. So if there's any problems, then they will come to you. It's assigned by a governing body and it just ticks the box. And the ICO, if you're handling any customer data, you need this. In other countries, like for example, in Dubai, where I also operate, I need to be uh, have a DTCM license for uh, every single property and also for my business. So you need to make sure that you know what licenses and what things you need setting up. But for the UK and Dubai where I operate, that's what you need to be able to set up and make sure that you're not gonna have any penalties or fines that are gonna hurt the profitability of your business for a simple thing. These things don't cost money. Um, and the last thing you want is an investigation or someone saying that you've used their data and you're not a member of the ICO and the fines can be quite hefty and that can really hurt the profitability of your business. And then in terms of insurances, which I think is important to have, you kind of need three different types of insurances to run the business. You need public liability, you need professional indemnity, and you also maybe need employer's liability insurance as well. So your public liability is obviously if a guest hurts himself in your property, then you're gonna be able to be covered. You're gonna be able to sleep at night knowing that if anything does, God forbid, happen to a guest, you're gonna be covered and your business is gonna be able to survive. Your professional indemnity is very similar. If you instruct a tradesperson to go into your property and then let's say, for example, the roof collapses on them, um, then again, you're going to be covered and it's not going to affect your business because if you aren't insured and these things do happen, then the court fees and potential any compensation claims that you're going to have to pay on, out on could end your business um, overnight. And then finally, again, employers uh, liability insurance. So if you have any employee disputes or again, if an employee gets injured at work or anything like that, then you are going to be covered and you're going to be able to keep your business moving in the right direction. But more the point, 
I think insurance is good for helping you just have peace of mind and sleep at night. I have touched based on contents insurance uh, with regards to furniture. I personally don't do it. I don't think that furniture devalues, goes down in value quite quickly. So for me, I think as you have a large portfolio, uh, the insurance premiums would massively outweigh the bits and bobs that you've got to top up over time or even anything that gets stolen. I don't bother with the contents insurance. Obviously, I have buildings insurance for my owned assets, which you need to have to be able to get mortgages. Uh, for contents insurance, I personally wouldn't bother. But the rest of them, I do bother with. And again, it's just so you've got peace of mind, you can sleep at night and you know your business is protected and you're not going to get wiped out by anything uh, or any nasty surprises because guests can check in for compensation and there are some horrible people out there who pry on businesses that is what you need to cover yourself in terms of the insurances and the last thing that i want to cover is my passion is is marketing i think any business that wants to survive and wants to thrive needs to have a fantastic marketing and brand plan in place I'm not going to cover it all in detail today because I do have a YouTube video coming up uh, shortly, which is going to cover specifically what you need to do to build a brand in the service accommodation arena. But one thing that I think you need to do, which a lot don't, is get all your socials connected. So your Facebooks, your Instagrams, your TikToks, uh, your LinkedIn's, get the, the, the brand feel, whatever your colors are, whatever your logos are. Get that feel across all of your business and then start posting content regularly. A mixture of video content and also static image content with good SEO descriptions or posts, uh, good hashtags so that you're in the searches will then help your journey. It will help your business move forward. You want to be documenting your journey on each and every step. You might say, well, I've got nothing to post about. I'm, I'm not experienced. Just post about going on viewings, post about researching for properties. Whatever you're doing, what you're trying to do is just show that your brand is a property investment company. It's a short-term rental company. You do this for guests, you do that for landlords. Whatever it is that you decide you want to do with this business, project that onto social media. You've got to stop caring what other people think. A lot of people don't post on social media because they're bothered about what other people will think. I can't remember who it was. I think it might be in Grand Cardone, but he, he, he once said, if you care about what people think that it stops you posting, it was Gary Vee actually, then you care more about those people than you do your bank balance, your kids and your generational wealth because that will stop you from achieving what you want to achieve. We live in a world today where you have to get yourself out there got to get omnipresence you need to be everywhere people need to know what you're doing and it will help your brand and it will help your conversion rates if you want to do a rent to rent agreement with someone there's a good chance that landlord's going to then check out your business they're going to check your website out they're going to check your socials out if they can't see that you're into property if they can't see that you're doing anything if they can't see that you've got any expertise there's a good chance they're not going to want to engage with you so you've got to be making sure that you are live and visible on as many social media platforms as many websites as you can get yourself on in a good way. And on that note, I quite see it often where people get very involved in politics and they get very opinionated on certain topics. Stay away from all of that. If you want to build a brand, you just want to talk about your niche, talk about what you do and talk about how you help people and just keep keep that as your information. Don't get involved in anything else because it can damage your success. Keep that outside of your business arena. You do not want things to affect how uh, your business operates or the success of your business. But in the beginning, just document what you're doing on a day to day basis, document any trainings you're doing, document viewings, any success stories, getting keys, setting properties up, and it all just adds to your journey. But you've got to start somewhere. And as I said, I'm going to cover it all off in a much longer video because I think it is a video in itself. And there's a lot of key points that I can teach you of how I've done it and how it's really impacted me and show you some statistics about why you need to do it but for now just get started by posting regularly if you're not already and if you are posting regularly start analyzing your content seeing what is working and then doubling down on that content because i think a lot of people don't analyze enough and they end up just posting for the sake of posting if you have enjoyed this as always please share this with somebody um comments or questions uh you know pop them below and um i will I guess see you on my next video. It's been quite long on this one, but um, thank you very much for your time and I will see you back soon.